Thank you for staying. Now in our first story, President Okufuado says he is optimistic about the future of the country that will guarantee unlimited access to education, healthcare, decent paying jobs, as well as a befitting and dignified retirement for its citizens. He says, Ghana, despite its huge potential, has not lived up to expectations since independence. He's also pledged to revive the economy. And challenges of today to shape our collective futures. The most recent of these challenges has been the COVID-19 pandemic, which has compromised the economic gains chalked in recent years. As a result of the pandemic and its impact on the economy, things are not what we would like as far as the economy is concerned. They've been worsened even further by the effects of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Government has, however, outlined a series of measures, including seeking the assistance of the International Monetary Fund in the short term to help repair our finances. I am confident that we will revive and revitalize the economy and put our nation back on the path of rapid economic growth, a scenario we had become accustomed to in the last three immediate years before the pandemic struck. This is a solemn pledge I'm making to you. I remain resolutely optimistic about Ghana's future, which I continue to believe is bright. The Ministry of Transport has ordered for the refurbishment and inclusion of the Elmina fish processing plant into the Elmina fishing harbour project. Sector Minister Kwekufo Riesiyama says the 105 million euro Elmina fishing harbour being built will be incomplete if the fish processing plant is not operational. The $11.6 million fish processing plant, which was commissioned in 2016, has not been op operational, but was reduced to the molding of iced blocks. In an interview with Joy News after inspecting the fishing harbour project, Mr. Siama assured that the harbour project, when completed, would augment trade in the central region. The transport minister toured the facility at Elmina to acquaint himself with the progress of work there. Kweku Furiesiyama expressed satisfaction with the rate of work currently ongoing at the site and asked for the abandoned Elmina fish processing plant to be included in the design of the harbour. According to him, the Elmina fishing harbour will not be complete if the fish processing plant built about six years ago is not incorporated in the plan. Uh, we cannot have this facility fully functioning without the fish processing plant. It is because of the existence of this fish processing plant that, that in the new construction we do not include it. So if there's a problem with it, we need to refurbish it. We need to make sure that it works. Because we cannot have a fishing harbour without a fish processing plant, which includes coastal and other things. So we need to have it ready. This is a fishing harbour. Yeah. This is not a landing site. Right. We have two fishing harbours in this country already. Right. We are upgrading this place into a fishing harbour. Okay. We are not doing a landing site. We are upgrading this place into a fishing harbour. Right. We have a secondary fishing harbour. We have a tamar fishing harbour. Yeah. There are two fishing harbours we are building in addition. Right. Here right. and Jamestown. Right. Uh -huh. in, in, in Accra. Right. And this place is going to be handed over. They will finish this fishing harbour. Later by the first quarter of next year. On the controversy of the promise of a harbour in Cape Coast, the minister indicated that the Ghana Port and Harbours Authority has a master plan within which ports are sited and within the coordinate, it's Elmina that's most plausible for the sighting of the harbour. He explained that when the harbour is completed, it will serve not only the people of Elmina, but the people of Cape Coast and all parts of the central region. He said he will build a port in Cape Coast, Bawa Elmina. But in our, G in our GPHA master plan, we name ports according to our coordinates. And if we say we will build a port in Cape Coast, not exactly, but, 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 but it's an enclave. But these are, yeah, for me, it's not a substantive matter that for me to do. But the most important thing is that what he did for me is it's actually being, being manifest. That he was going to build a port, and that's exactly what we set out ourselves to do. And because of the COVID, this project has delayed a bit. And I need to retreat to this point. I'm praying that all day you appreciate what government has done for them. This is the president who has set out himself or set out himself to develop this country. Now according to his electoral fortunes. 
everybody knows that Emina is under our best place when it comes in terms of election. But as far as he's concerned, he's been voted as a president to develop, to develop this country. So whether the people vote for him or they don't vote for him, he has a mandate to develop. And that's exactly what he's going to do. So when people out there cried our president that he was going to vote a poor for people of Cape Coast, he hasn't done it. The contractor for the project, Wim Van Hoof, explains the work done so far by the Bell C Limited Ghana Limited, the contractors for the project. Well, first of all, it's called the Amina Fishing Harbor uh, Rehabilitation Project. Um, before we came here, there was a, a port with two breakwaters. Um, if you turn around, you'll see that it's now the very large new breakwater has been installed. Um, there is a new reclamation, actually where we are standing right now. Uh, ten months ago, it was water. Um, some buildings will be built uh, specific, specifically for the fishermen. Um, and then behind me, you can see another breakwater, effectively extending the port three and a half times reached almost 90% completion. Uh, we've done uh, our major scope, the breakwaters, the reclamation, where we are standing now. We are almost finalizing the key wall. When they intend completing the project and subsequently when they are handing it over. The 105 million euro project is expected to help shore up the fishing businesses of the people of Elmina, Cape Coast and the Central Region. Reporting for Joy News, Richard Kujunyakun, Cape Coast. Let's talk now about the National Service Secretariat, which is asking for an increment in the allowances paid to service personnel. Executive Director Osei Esibe Enchi says the proposal is awaiting approval from the Education Ministry. He was speaking at the National Service Personnel Association's Mini Congress in Ho. National Service personnel in Ghana have been expressing strong disapproval of their 559 Ghana cities' four pesos monthly allowance. They lamented the allowance is woefully inadequate to take them through the month and appealed for an increment. Speaking at the 13th Annual Mini Congress of the National Service Personnel Association in Ho, the Executive Director of the National Service Scheme, Osei Asibe Entry, hinted at plans to increase the allowance. We've gotten all the demands on us from the new executives, especially about seeing that your allowance is moved up. To your information, the board, we've sent it to the board. The board has given us the approval, so we've sent it to the appropriate quarters. That is, we've sent it to the central government for government to look into your allowance issue. So rest assured, that very soon you also smile as others are also smiling. He detailed that the scheme has changed its mission statement to mobilizing for employment, positioning itself to help resolve graduate unemployment. For all these years, the mission statement for national service was mobilization for deployment. But with the support of my directors, then together we brainstorm and have changed the mission statement for the simple reason that if you base your argument and you analyze the first mission statement, it was only positioning us as a conveyance belt. We were just picking and taking the class leaks from the university, then deploring them to the various user agencies. But now that we have changed the mission statement, it has given us a duty, it has given us a task, and the task is that we need to support the central government to be able to solve the unemployment situation. The Volta Regional Minister, Dr. Achibod Lecha, expressed optimism the Akufado government would rescue Ghana from the current economic crisis. The difficulties we are going through is not peculiar to our country. It's very important. Sometimes those of us who watch CNN, Sky News, all the, 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 the networks are those who even uh, 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 behave as if Ghana is the only country going through these current uh, difficulties. But I believe that the government of His Excellency Nana Dodanko Akufaru will take us through this difficulty and Ghana will be on the path of growth once again. We have to uh, uh, let people understand that education is the only way we can get out of poverty. So when any government council decides that Everybody must go to school, whether your parents have money or not. It is, some, it is an investment we are making 
into the future of this country. Hallelujah. Fred Kwame Asai. Well, the Bulu East Regional Health Directorate has reiterated its commitment towards achieving its target of fully vaccinating 70% of the region's population. Regional Director of Health Services, Dr. Fred Adumakubwating, at a half-year meeting to review the performance of the region, disclosed that with the region's case fatality far above the national average, a higher vaccination coverage is the surest way to save the people against the COVID-19 pandemic. Anas Abit was at the meeting and now reports. Speaking at a media meeting to review the performance of the region for the first half of the year and deliberate on how to improve the region's general health care delivery, the Bunu East Regional Director of Health Services, Dr. Fred Admarko Boatin, said the region is working towards achieving its COVID-19 vaccination target of 85% single dose and 70% fully vaccinated as a means of curbing the spread of the pandemic across the region. Currently, with 835,086 eligible population for the vaccines, 433,781, that is 51, almost 52 percent, have been vaccinated with the dose. And 326,032, that is 39 percent, are fully vaccinated. Mr. Chair. The question that we have been asking ourselves, how do we reach the target of 85% single dose for Bono East? And how do we also achieve 70% fully vaccinated? Because you can see from all the figures that we are discussing that the game changer over here is the vaccination exercise, among other things. And therefore, looking at the nature of Bunu East, there is nothing that we can do in a quest to overcome this COVID without actually increasing the uptake. Dr. Fred Admarko Boaten is optimistic that with the numerous challenges facing the region in terms of logistics and resources, a wider COVID vaccination coverage will help protect the region's workforce. You know the challenges that we are having as a newly created region? We are less endowed in terms of equity, infrastructure, human resources, we are lacking. Even within Bunis, we are having that challenge. So the low-hanging fruit that we can really address is the having higher coverage for the uh, COVID-19 vaccines. If we are able to do that, then it means that should we have any wave or surge, then we are well protected. Chairman of the Location and Director of the Kintampo Health Research Center, Dr. Kwekupuku Asante, on his part, expressed concern with the increase in the number of hypertensive cases in the region. In our next story, the Executive Director of uh, Nuclear Power Ghana has revealed that Ghana's nuclear power plant, when completed, has the capacity of generating 1,000 megawatts of electricity. Professor Stephen Yamwa was speaking at a workshop for selected editors from where Adum TV's editor, Martha Quenzel Aqua, now reports. Two of the workshop focused on writing about basic science and technology, understanding technical issues, as well as basic safety, safeguards and security requirements of nuclear power and safety concerns of the public. Delivering his lecture, the director of the Nuclear Power Institute, Professor Seth Debra, noted that nuclear power is safe as the conception through management and decommissioning are properly regulated. Go to the etymology of education, it comes from the word ethical, is to draw out. So everybody has his or her, we call it the bend of the person. What the person is good at what is your passion? And then, based on that passion, the teacher needs to draw out that passion. And you build on that passion. On the concern of the level of radiation humans are exposed to, the executive director of the nuclear power Ghana indicated it largely depends on the dosage, but most people ordinarily will not be exposed to dangerous levels, even if they work at the nuclear power plant. 
On capacity, Professor Stephen Yamwa revealed Ghana's nuclear power plant, when regulated, could add 1,000 megawatts of electricity to the national grid. So, I, mean, I said 1,000. 2,000, 1,000 too. Because it depends on the, the technology. The Russian technology is about 1,200 megawatts. The Chinese one is about 1,100. The Indian reactor is 700 megawatts. The South Korean reactor, 1,400 megawatts. The French, 1,006 megawatts. So that is the range of the large reactors. Engineer Dr. William Amuna, who is the technical controller at the Millennium Development Authority and former CEO of Gridco, in his presentation on public safety and environmental concerns, urged operators of Ghana's nuclear plant to ensure there is maximum security at all fronts, including picking only the best engineers to work at the plant. Maybe one of the units we need a tower to operate, that will not affect the system. But where you have a station that will have a big 1,000 megawatt unit, and then it goes off, your system will collapse. The other interesting thing I want to state here is the fact that journalists are always talking about 100 megawatt, 2,000 megawatts. I will talk about energy, gigawatt hours, kilowatt hours. That is what is important. The load factor for the nuclear plant, I think it's over 90 percent. 98%. Akoso Mo produces about 5,000 gigawatt hours a year. And this nuclear plant will also produce a similar thing. The 1,000 megawatt capacity expected from Ghana's nuclear power plant when completed at its full capacity is the same as the full capacity of the Akosombo Dam. Martha Krensalakwa reporting for Joy News. Now, the CEO of the microfinance and small loan center, Maslok Abibata Shani Mahama Zakaria, wants parents to take advantage of government's free senior high school policy to give their girls a better education. She said this at the Glitz Africa Female CEO's breakfast meeting. Sarah Mensa's report is now read to you. So, in my case, as a 12 year old, as Honorable Dukua said, mine was a very typical one growing up from the northern part of the country and being a Muslim girl, but fortunately raised by someone who was a, an educated person, educationist, and a politician. Chief Executive Officer for Microfinance and Small Loan Center, Abiba Tashani Mahama Zakaria, sharing her story with young girls at the Gleets Africa Female CEO's Breakfast Meeting on Thursday in Accra. She advised parents and guardians to take advantage of the free senior high school policy introduced by government to give their girls good education. This, she believes, can help develop young girls into future leaders and break the stereotype that women are not capable of doing jobs dominated by men. In their time, they are fortunate enough to have free education at the SHS level. Gone are the days when people didn't have those opportunities. So as much as possible, I am appealing to parents of young girls that they should uh, encourage their girls to be in school to the level at free SHS. And uh, uh, thankfully too, apart from free SHS, if they are not able to go to secondary school, we also have the technical uh, vocational schools. Rwandan Ambassador to Ghana, Dr. Aisha Karibo Kasira, who also spoke at the event, was unhappy only a few women are giving the opportunity to take part in decision-making in the country. She also called on government to expedite the passage of the Affirmative Action Bill. I think about only a few weeks ago, the Parliament of Ghana, the Speaker, and I think a he led a delegation for a study tour to Rwanda and they have signed a name on you. I trust and I hope that I think from there we'll exchange um, notes. I mentioned to you that when I came to Accra the first time, I saw the hard work of women. And I knew they had the key to really the social economic transformation. But as long as they are not in positions of leadership, there is a disconnect. 
that is what it is globally. So I think we need to lift that kind of power from there, put it in decision-making positions and support it. Women are quite central. I think it's important that we all support them, not just because you are women, but because they deserve it and they are capable of doing it. Founder of GLEAT South Africa Magazine and organizer of the CEO's breakfast meeting, Claudia Lumo agrees the bill must be passed quickly. I believe that when women are in certain positions, things are done and done well. I mean, capable women, when you put capable women in certain positions, things are done and done really well. I mean, um, and us not um, passing this affirmative action in all these years, I mean, see what Rwanda has done with years. I mean, different countries, we've seen successful stories in other countries that why, why, you know, why the delayance in Ghana? And um, imagine with even the little or the minimal women that we have in parliament or we have in businesses see the progression that's happening so imagine if we had even 30 percent of it sarah mentors report for joy news that's how we serve it up for the news but up next we serve you the news review do stay Thank you for staying with us. It's a Friday morning and we cut into the newspapers and what they have for us. And guess who's joining me? Samuel Kojo Brace. Doing the do. Yeah. Sammy, morning. Yeah. Morning. Yeah. Morning. Yeah. morning. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Samina. Please, please, please. Man, man start it. Ah, Unikiso. Ah, uh, 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 ah. Oh, yeah, Samina. Uh, I'm sure you wanted to say a Samina. Uh, 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 a Samina. Oh, come back on, no, back on, no, no, make her. But some, some ones they hear there, some you know, they think <laughs> it has to do with it. Now, I'm sure you so, want to, so, uh, say, Mina, is that what you are asking for? Uh, and, uh, you wanted to say, Kedia. No, 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 no. Not, okay. not, not to your own. You know those who say on your seminar. Or you people, you also say, uh, a hunter, we also have the, the, the way in there. Which one? So, yeah. what, what is the a hunter rendition? Of what? Of what I said. I don't even, I didn't even hear what you said. You're just what being, you you're just oh. being <laughs> unnecessarily. Eh? Why are you being mischievous this oh, morning? No, no, no. What, what, I mean, a uh, seminar. In my language, when we say a seminar, mm -hmm. it means what are you saying? A eh. seminar. Ah. A seminar. So, like, you say something to me, and I'm like, a seminar. How do you say good morning in your language again? Mumawahe. 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 Or, mumawahe. You know, my baba, my baba, my mama be ahe. My mama bashe, or my washe, and my washe. So if you say, if I want to say good morning to you, I say my mama o ahe. But if I want to say good morning to all of you, my mama be ahe. It's beautiful how languages yeah. operate and the different changes and all of that. I, I was being, like, being someone who is fond of languages myself, into my mama ahe. Good. My mama ahe. My mama ahe. Good. So our ahe. Good, good, good. good. So, <laughs> good. So, uh -huh. so uh, we say Colombia for egg. Oh. Kosia, Nchefua, Colombia. Colombia. Uh, hey. So, so ours, the Enzima and Brosa and our win. Similar. Do you speak any Enzima? Uh, yes, a little. So, like, Kode, mm. Bete, uh, Mukosuanu. Mukosuanu means I'm going home in Enzima. Ahanta will say muko. Will so you're pretty, you're pretty adept with Enzima. It's it's yeah. not a big deal compared Wait, no, to the Ahanta. No, 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 no. When you speak, I'll hear everything. But I can I how can to speak, respond. Uh, I can speak some, not all. Right. Like the Enzima person will also hear everything I say. Right. But I cannot speak it. Kind of like the Ga, the Dangbe. Yes. Thing. I should think so. Like twin sister language. Right. Right. Our is a sister language to Enzima, Awin, Brosa. Mm. And then there is one tribe in Ivory Coast. I've forgotten their name. Enyin. Mm -hmm. So the five languages are similar. Anyway, so uh, very interesting lessons we're getting this morning from the man Samuel Kojobris. And uh, now that you mentioned the Ivory Coast, you know a lot of them also, I mean, there are 
into linkages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for, for example, Freddie Mayway, mm -hmm. you would see that in some of mm -hmm. his songs, you would hear... Enzema. Exactly. Because of the... Exactly. They are very close. Yeah. And Enzema is... My, my, my brothers and sisters will forgive me, but, you know, at the point, they are hey. abroad. Remember to bomb how? They are abroad was Ivory Coast. So, a lot of them are going to Ivory Coast. Yeah, so. Please, I dissociate myself totally from these comments. Uh, they won't be angry. You can know. only <laughs> <laughs> accuse a certain of control breaks. But on that note, I think he's up to mischief. Very mischievous. <laughs> so, let's get into the papers. I have the Daily Graphic, Daily Guide, uh, the Custodian, and the Accra Times. What do you have this morning? Um, I have the Times, the Ghanaian Times, I have the Finder, uh, the Daily Statesman, I have the Republic, and the Publisher. Okay, so Republic that. Press. Right. Um, All right. Let's start with you. Okay, so the Ghanaian Times newspaper. It says, uh, economy will bounce back stronger. That's according to President Kufuado. <clears throat> um, when he was speaking at the Founders Day luncheon, that's where he made the statement. Uh, a bit of uh, details there on this story. Again, we know how difficult things are have been for the economy. He says that he is optimistic about the country's economic recovery and its future, despite the current challenges the nation is going through. Um, now, the president says the, the, the country's economy would bounce back stronger than ever before. Uh, he said the can-do spirit of Ghanaians, which led to the country's independence from British colonial rule, would guide the government's effort to address the economic challenges. So a bit of uh, some reassurance there that whatever we're going through now, things will take shape. Things will be better. Uh, <clears> let's <throat> see how it, uh, the how for us to get to the better point is what we're looking at. But let's see how it goes. Uh, Ghana records 400,000 tourist arrivals in first quarter of 2022, according to Dr. Awal. Um, 12 die in road crash at Edweje. That's in the Commander Edna Ebafu yeah. Ebrim. Yeah municipality um, uh, so those are the stories and a ban on new lpg facilities lifted so those are the stories on the front page of the Ghanaian times newspaper i think the the 12 dies is something that uh, the the mca is talking tough yeah that whoever i think there was a fire which was lit around the road which generated some smoke mm -hmm. and i'm told this is the reason why there was poor visibility on the road he says Whoever is culpable will be dealt with, according to the law, I, I hope. I hope that happens. You remember the, the case of Ebony, Ebony Rains, mm -hmm. and how supposedly there was yeah. a pile of sand mm -hmm. which should not have been yeah. eating into the road and in trying to avoid it. You know, these things are often things you would see. <clears throat> but Rocks, you know, these stones for... Yeah. Quarry stones. Quarry stones. Mm -hmm. Sand. You would often see some very, you know, yeah. uh, prominent stretches of road, and they've mm -hmm. been blocked by an individual mm -hmm. or, or company or mm -hmm. something of the yeah. sort. And then you now have to meander through. And in doing so, if you have an accident, who is to blame? Mm. You know, yeah. these things happen all the time. And so I, I was going to say that Ebony's death didn't teach us any lesson. Because Obviously, we like didn't learn the lessons. Major roads. You see that we've dumped sand and quarry stones beside it, sometimes taking half of the road. Yeah. And we are okay. Nobody talks about it. Mm. it it's, we are in a very serious place. But another story that, that I don't know if uh, the numbers are good for us, mm. 400,000 tourists in first quarter. I think it, it should be, which means that we have... We record about a million tourists, 800,000 to a million tourists, even, a, a, even yeah. considering the year of return mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. all the other dynamics mm -hmm. uh, to it. So then if, it should be good. If, um, because in first the first quarter... quarter that is the first uh, what? Three, months. three months. Yes, we've got this. Then it means there's yeah. some uptick. If it will, numbers. it will repeat. It means that we'll be making 1.6 million by end of the year. Right. If you are, you are holding every constant, every everything, every, constant. every factor constant. Right. Then hmm. maybe we should just hold the numbers constant because <laughs> the factors may different things may may happen. But uh, it, it would also be on the back of. COVID-19 restrictions being eased now mm -hmm. and people, uh, you know, so the fact uh, that economic that life returning to mm -hmm. some level of normalcy, not full levels of normalcy, mm -hmm. but some levels of normalcy. So mm -hmm. who knows? Anyway, let's but we pray yeah, this, this is sure, sure, sure. Like, like the other time, like we were saying here the other time, if roads leading to our tourist site right. are developed, right. telling you. Even we'll, intra-country yeah, yeah, yeah. tourism. We'll do more. You would want to go yeah. there, but... Mm -hmm. The, the sites leading to some of them are terrible. Are terrible. And, and you know that if you're going there, your shocks, if you're driving your own car, your shocks mm -hmm. and everything are going to be affected. You expend more fuel trying yeah. to navigate and all of that. Mm -hmm. It's a disincentive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's good. If we really want to boost tourism, I think we need to look at the roads leading to this site. Yeah. 
Let's quickly do the Daily Graphic newspaper. New EC constitutional instrument. Don't use only Ghana card. It mm. can disenfranchise millions. Guess who's speaking? The man. You've seen, the, you've seen his, yeah. his photo. You can call him the doyen of elections oh, yes, in yes. Ghana. It's in the fourth republic. How do we say in and Africa? Because his, well, his expertise was sought well, for by many well, countries. In, in well, you continent. have a point. Yeah. And especially looking at the transition, mm -hmm. you know, he actually oversaw a transition yeah. back to back. Mm -hmm. And, about, and about, that, was, that, was, that was monumental, dealing yeah. with a situation where Kufour came and took over, mm -hmm. John Ejekum Kufour yeah. came and took over from 2000, mm -hmm. and then again Atavios. overseeing the exchange from 2008 mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. to the NDC. This yeah. man, we can't talk elections without him. But what has he been saying? The decision of the Electoral Commission to use the Ghana card as the only source document for continuous voter registration can disenfranchise millions of qualified electorate. A former chairman of the EC, Dr. Kwejo Afarijan, has stated. He said, with many Ghanaians finding it difficult to get their Ghana cards, making it the only form of identification for voter registration was against electoral inclusivity, fairness, and justice. I'm just going to end with this quote. He says, Ghanaian citizens don't lose their citizenship if they are 18 years or older, but do not have the Ghana card. So the moot question is, why make the Ghana card the only means of identification for purposes of establishing eligibility to register to vote? Very simple question. And um, uh, th let's talk about that later, CI and all of that. But pertinent questions being raised here by none other, no less a person Kwajo, than Dr. Kwajo, Dr. Kwajo Afarijan. Afarijan. What, what do you make of this? No, no, I, I, I think <clears throat> that the Ghana card, we have all agreed that it is the, it is where we want to move to, mm. where we all have all our data in, in on, one, one place, system. if you like. Yes. Right. And so if we say we're going to use that, I, I don't have a problem with it. I think the mm. challenge is, when are we planning to start this exercise? And what is the assurance from the NIA that almost all, or all qualified people will have access to their Ghana card by then? Because I think that we should, we, we have to get to a point where we say, Ghana card is what we're using to right. do most of the things. Right. Because look, when we're able to build this system very well, the benefits are huge. And, and, and we agree. I mean, you know, we've had, Times here talking together with Bernice, mm -hmm. together with you, mm -hmm. about the relevance yeah. of this. No one can take that away. I mean, administration in and out, they've tried to do this. Mm -hmm. The NDC attempted it. I mean, they, they did something, but it did not culminate in what we are seeing now. Mm -hmm. So it's progressive. Mm -hmm. But the point is the progressivity or progressiveness mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't rush certain things, mm -hmm. especially as the system is not yet what we would that want it why to be. That's why I'm asking the question. So progressively, when, when, when are we looking at, when are we looking at <clears> this Ghana card? Now we are told some, I mean, some, some or a little over 15 million people have access to the Ghana card. Right. 16 point something million of the cards have been printed. Right. Okay. How many people are pay, pay uh, the, the census we did? How many mm. people are eligible right. to, to register for the voter, vo, right. vo, voters, voters ID? So or to be part of the, you know, the voter because register. Because it's not the entire population. Exactly. Right. So if we know the number of people who are expected to be part of the register, and we know how many of such have had their cards given by the NIA, the remainder, what is the plan by the NIA to issue those cards? I, I think and, that... And, and it, that's mm -hmm. the tricky bit, because even in response in a related matter, the mm -hmm. same re-registration mm -hmm. exercise, uh, Professor Ken Atefua, the, the CEO of the NIA, mm -hmm. made a very important point. He says, this is a continuous process. We are mm -hmm. not bound by timelines. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense. Okay. Looking at the constraints we have faced, looking at the cues we have seen, looking at, I mean, the different dynamics, mm -hmm. logistics, accessibility, and all of that. I mean, there are people, for example, who register for their cards mm. uh, so, so many years ago. And maybe because uh, the, there was a town close to a major city, mm. they, it wasn't you know, put into the system correctly that they registered in this town. Rather, it was just the city, maybe Takradi, mm. that was put there. But there was a town close to Takradi. And now they don't even know where their cards were because their cards went elsewhere. Mm. Now it can't be mm. found anywhere. Mm. So there are all of those dynamics. But the yeah. point to be made is between now and 2024 as well, there are a lot of people who are going to turn 18. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who are going to be within that age bracket who would require the Ghana card, which is why in doing any, conducting any such exercise, we must be sure to in, you know, ensure, uh, <laughs> repeating that line, mm -hmm. that what Afarijan is, is suggesting here does not happen, that we mm -hmm. don't end up disenfranchising anybody. Mm -hmm. Already on the back of Saul, 
the San Trocofi, Akbafu, uh, Likpe, and Lolobi areas, mm -hmm. that dynamic in there, which is a different matter. We have ended up disenfranchising some people. But, but, let's, but, not, let's not have another situation where, on the back of the Ghana mm -hmm. card, someone could be disenfranchised. But do you know that on that score, then we, there can never be a time where we will say that we are going to use only the Ghana card as a, as a source of proving your nationality. Because, which, is, which is why, because which people is why Dr. Farijan is saying, uh, you may, maybe, since you've not got to that point, mm -hmm. and we should also have a mechanism in place mm -hmm. so that once, for example, you see, I always make the point about the vice president saying, from the cradle to the grave, more or less, mm -hmm. you have your Ghana card, so you are born, you get a number, mm -hmm. unique number. When your biometrics are formed, they are taken, then you get your card, mm -hmm. and then the process follows from there. That we have a sort of rolling system, so that if that system works, over time, when you turn 18, mm -hmm. there's even no need for anyone to say that the system yeah. recognizes you are 18 mm -hmm. and you are qualified mm -hmm. to vote. Mm -hmm. But we are not there so, yet, so, which so. is why maybe using mm -hmm. the Ghana card as the mm -hmm. sole document mm -hmm. to acquire voting rights mm -hmm. is problematic. But you know that from, from now on what? If we sort of do two national ID cards at a time, that means that we are still not eliminating the other cards. But why would we need two? We are putting everything on the, on the Ghana card. You have your voters, you have your passport, if you have a driver's license. All of these data is on that, 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 that uh, system and on that card, effectively. So why are we saying that, okay, we have to use two cards to prove one's nationality? Mm. I am thinking, if we want to go by, by this, yes, but, we'd but, have to but, wait but, for But obviously, obviously, before we can. obviously, I am thinking are, that it's people. about it's the processes mm. where the EC and the NIA should agree on, 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 on a setting line or a setting way of, of handling this. Mm. So that the two entities, if I come to register for, for the voters mm. and I don't have, the, the way I'm going to testify my or uh, guarantee my nationality when I'm regist registering for the Ghana card should be that same process where I can probably say I'm going to uh, testify for my nationality when I'm, I'm registering for the um, EC's vo voter card. Mm. There, should, there should be a collaboration between the two. Mm. Because if we say we are not there yet, we will wait forever mm. for this to work. And I think that we have to all agree to a point where we say we, we, all, we are all agreeing that let's do with this one card. Because I, I don't think there's a problem with that. I think mm -hmm. by and large, practically mm -hmm. every Ghanaian mm -hmm. buys into the fact that this card is a good thing mm -hmm. and integrating mm -hmm. all these other aspects because you can't have a slit card. You're doing mm -hmm. both biometrics. You have that card, biometrics, mm -hmm. this card, which is what we've been doing. Yeah. So you have one card that is a one size fits all mm -hmm. card. That is fine. But ensure that while some people don't have the card, mm -hmm. if it comes to any registration exercise mm -hmm. for voting, mm -hmm. you make access available to them, at least in the interim, because these same people are using other source documents, like the Ghana passport. How come you can use that to get your Ghana card, mm -hmm. but you can't use that to get your... Well, so, it's, so, it's, so those are so, some of the... So it's, it's a discussion I think we can all have yeah. and all agree, but I'm saying that the two entities should, should collaborate because, look... The EC, the voters register, is a huge data we cannot joke with. Mm. The Ghana card, the National Identification Authority, has all of our data. So there should be a an effective collaboration between the two entities mm. if we want to do away with all of these things. Let's make tracks. In other stories, that uh, head-on collision uh, where 12 people died is also captured on page 20 of the Daily Graphic newspaper. Students loan trust fund to prosecute defaulters. Story on page 13. And another interesting one, National Cathedral Board of Trustees, Men of Integrity, Prof uh, Professor Frimpong Manso uh, says uh, so. So the Students' Loan Trust Fund will, from September this year, begin the prosecution of persons who have defaulted in the repayment of their loans for over a 10-year period. The affected persons will include all who have benefited from the loan but are yet to repay despite being gainfully employed now. I like that addition because I was just about to say, how about if they don't have any gainful means of employment? Mm. The second bit... National Cathedral Board of Trustees, Men of Integrity, and the General Superintendent of the Assemblies of God Church, Reverend Professor Paul Frim, Paul Manso, has charged Christians not to allow political actors to divide their front in their resolve to support uh, the building of the National Cathedral. He stressed that the Board of Trustees was made up of men of integrity and not thieves or criminals, and had committed to the proper use and management of the money dedicated to the building of uh, the cathedral. I, I, I think it, the <clears throat> issue is not about politicians. Mm. The issue is about government not being forthright. I think the issue is about Ghanaians. Uh, mm. I, I think that is the mm. point that sometimes is missed. And even, no matter how good a policy, mm -hmm. even when you go back to the Greek polis, where 
practically everyone would have to come together and vote and then eventually they would have to select certain people and the concept of the philosopher king, it must be democracy mm. of the people, by the people, for the people. What do the people say? What I do think, they want? No, I do think they want that. a national cathedral? Mm -hmm. and, and even if you're you are putting <clears throat> a national cathedral, it's about transparency. Right. Things are not too transparent. Ghanaians don't, because you see, all the, <clears throat> the account that we've seen, it just doesn't really... Uh, Things don't add up. Uh, exactly, and that's why people are not buying into it. Yeah. Let's get into other stories. Well, the finder says, December <clears throat> in Ghana to attract 150,000 tourists, hospitality, fun, leisure, await them. That's according to Dr. Awal. And uh, I'm, I'm, myself and my friends are planning to take some people to Takrade to be part of the Ankos Festival there. So yeah, uh, December in, in Ghana is, is an, is an yeah. uh, you know, extraordinary period in, in our life. So we are with some great fun there. Access Bank Ghana records 43% growth in profit before tax. Um, our economy will bounce back. That's the story we dealt with. And then this one says, MPA left ban on construction of new LPG stations. It, a, it is cabinet because they themselves, MPA made it clear that they were not the people who played the ban. Right. So it, it's only the cabinet that can lift it. So it's cabinet that lifted this ban, and that's paving way for more gas stations to be built. Mm. Mm. Let's get and into some stories. We have to state that <clears throat> yeah, these are not like new. These these are not like new stations. No, these were not. stations that were under construction exactly. before the ban exactly. in 2017. Exactly. So if you see that there was, there, was, there was a place where there was no gas station, and now because of this a station is coming, the police you can report anyway. Exactly. Mm. Well, the Daily Guide: Africa to become job seekers destination. That's according to uh, Pastor Mensa Otabel. Uh, man bonks three daughters uh, find 12,000 Ghana CDs. 13 perish on Cape Coast at uh, Takwadi Road. Uh, mm. The Daily Guide reporting 13. But um, some quick uh, stories that I'd like us to look at. CD loses 7% value to mm -hmm. dollar. Um, uh, that is in the last month of the third quarter of 2022. This has taken the year-to-date depreciation to 20.5% on the interbank market. Those are the dynamics. And a very sad, very sad development. Uh, City FM's Bernard Pavle uh, 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 loses uh, 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 wife. Uh. And um, in fact, it's a very, very sad development if you've not caught, you know, mm. got wind of it yet. Um, details of her sad demise are still sketchy, but widespread reports on Thursday alleged that she died on Wednesday evening. According to the reports, she collapsed, was rushed to a hospital facility but she couldn't survive. Our condolences to, our sincere condolences to Bernard, Bernardino, as uh, we all call him, uh, to the family and to the, you know, the city uh, group for this loss. We commiserate with you. Uh, it's, a, it's a really sad development, really tough times, you know, considering Young their ages man. and, Young and man like three that. children in there and all of that. Not anything. You wouldn't wish this even on your no, worst enemy. Oh no, Charlie. Really sad. I met really sad. him and a wife, I think in 2012 <clears throat> or 13 in UCC. Right. I think he's, he said the wife uh, attended the University of Cape Coast. So they came there. I'm for not a, sure of that, but. I mean, uh, well, maybe. They, they were there for a program. He was a speaker. He came there with, with her and he has told her really. And I was, Word is that everywhere he went, he wow. extolled his wife, her oh. virtues, and the fact that he was because she was. Kind of like the Ubuntu concept, you know. Yes. And uh, we can only pray that mm. uh, God will strengthen him together mm. with the family through these very telling times. But, but Charlie, tough. Anyway, yeah, very really tough. tough. Let's may, check out some may, other stories. May God really, um, you know, be with him in these trying times. Amen. Now, the Delhi statement, police probe bizarre death of couple in Kumasi. Oh, yeah, that, that, that very troubling story. I saw you almost shedding tears yeah. yesterday, live on air. Charlie, Joy News Desk. Yeah, the, <clears throat> I mean, listening to the narrative, I was, I was moved mm. that a mother would have a daughter go and say bye-bye to her at the airport. And for five years, that's it. The lady comes back and look at the circumstance. That the, the woman dies, the husband preserves the body in the room, locks the children up in, in, in a room for how many months? Mm. And just to, you know, empathize with them, feel that you were the one in that situation, how would you have behaved? It's, it's such a...
tough times that kids have been in, and and this is going to be with them for a. Ve I'm not sure they can even. It's going to it. be traumatizing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this is where often uh, PTSD and all of that come in. Post traumatics, you know, stress disorder and all of that. Hmm. Especially when you you, you 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 know that your mother died and they locked you up in a room, it's something else. So the pro the police is probing into that now. Energy Ministry says a Mary location followed extensive study. So you know, um, uh, ASAP brought out some facts about this Mary relocation, saying that it was sole sourced and it was not good for the country. Energy Ministry says, well, we did a f an extensive study before agreeing on the relocation. So let's see how this takes us. But again, one good story on the front page is that Sunyai Airport bounces back, President commissions refurbished facilities. So let's see how you, now you can travel to Sunyai easily, in and out. That's a good development. I remember when we went there and all the talk about it. So it's a good development that now uh, it has got to the stage. To wrap with just two stories from two papers, the Accra Times, uh, Bagbin commends MPs for standing on their ground. That's on page two. You can check out details from there. And in the Custodian newspaper on page eight, pictured here, Dr. Mustafa Abdul Hamid, the MPA boss. The story is government lifts ban on new LPG stations. And that's uh, a wrap for me, for the papers I have. Um, the Republic Press, he wasn't given bed at 37. Mami Dokuno narrates how Wache sadly wow. passed on. Mm. Um, you know, Kwame Japan says he wants to. This one says Kwame Japan cries foul as he declares presidential ambition. Mm. Mm, so let's see. He's been he's been taking quite a swipe at mm. uh, yeah. his own mm. party mm. and, and mm. Uh, the ruling government in recent times, okay. even at the finance minister. Electricity and water tariffs to go up from September one. So prepare for it. Are you ready? Not ready. Even this morning I was complaining about fuel. Actually, I went to, I went to fill up and I was like. I probably have to charge anybody who asks me to come and do something for him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Charlie, right now. Nowadays, driving long distance Eesh. is something I don't usually do because at the end of the day, Charlie. what used to cost me about 230, 240 CDs is now costing me about 560 yeah. plus CDs. The full situation is serious. It is. Charlie, this one, it hit me. It hit you? Eh? Yeah. Where did it hit you? In the jaw or in the... In the tummy and the jaw. Like two blows. You know, when someone hey. hits you like this. At least you weren't knocked out. We thank God for that. I was. Just that I, I put up a brazen face. Yeah. Mm, yeah. yeah. I was knocked out, really. You're like the Royal Storm. Dugby. Charlie, yeah. You survived. Yeah, survived. You took the punches. Your face was a bit, but mm, you, but I'm, I'm you okay. retained your title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Charlie. Charlie. You know how we do. Yeah. Thanks for joining me. For those of you who did the watching, thanks for joining us as well. Sports is up next. After that, I'll be sharing with you my blunt thoughts today on, some call it the resource curse. We have practically everything, but how much are we making out of what we have? And is our royalty system really working for us in Ghana? Stay with us for all of that. I don't know you for your God. Fourth August 2021. A movement that started only as a social media hashtag, Fix the Country, had metamorphosed into perhaps the biggest protest organized by a non political group in Ghana. A movement of ordinary citizens was now demanding strict accountability of its government. I think that's very important that we show that we reject the attitude of the government and we want to create a culture of dissent. It's important that we create a culture of dissent. We show our disapproval. We are tired of the lies. Article 71 office holders are lies. It is bogus. It is a calculated attempt to steal us. We are tired of the mendaciloquence, the zabanism and the political prostitute. Their plan was to spread the protest across the country. Today, August 4, is a rebirth of Ghana. And this in itself is a manifestation of that rebirth. But this is not the end. This is actually the beginning. I come 
We are all hungry in this country, and we won't allow tribalism to divide us. From here, we are going to Kumasi, Tamale, because we want all of us to participate in this demonstration. But this was not to be. After exactly a year, a breakaway by the Economic Fighters League, the arrest and prosecution of Oliver Baker Vormawa for alleged treasonable comments and a general lack of activity have made the group a pale shadow of its former self. It felt like the, the, there wasn't that pursuit of the message which was fix the country. It was just about some people giving themselves some self-importance and self-aggrandizing sort of, you know, status. That's Chris Atadika. Because he once was a strong supporter of the group, is not for a but not anymore. Or, 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 or a selected group of people. Face the country is something that lies in the heart of every young person in Ghana. So we, we, we use our roads, we see bad roads, we feel it inside us that, that no, this thing needs to be fixed. At a point, you had some faction of the leaders coming out to put out a statement saying they are no more part of the movement. So I blame the leaders for it because obviously, if they also blame our leadership for the poor status of our country, right? If Fix the Country itself as a movement wasn't able to work, it means the leadership of Fix the Country also needs to be blamed. And why did the EFL abandon the Fix the Country ship? I meet fighter Hardy Yakubu for some answers. The, the main thing is that they were there were uh, uh, measures, actions, utterances, clearly, consistently. And this is not just once or twice, okay, consistently. Let's talk about trying very hard, you know, to push the, the, the message in a way that clearly was in the benefit of the uh, opposition. If we wanted to be in the opposition or to join the opposition, we would have joined it. If we wanted to join the, uh, the government, we would have done so. This is strongly rejected by Fix the Country. Felicity Nelson is one of the conveners. I, that's completely false. I, this isn't something that I'm ever going to support. And if there's, they made a lot of allegations when they had their press conference. And all of those allegations came with literally no proof. So if they're saying some persons who, if you tell me some persons are pushing in favor of a certain political party, who's that person? Who, what political party is that? You know, you know, be bold. If you're bold enough to make allegations, back them up and say this particular person, that particular person, on this particular day, this is what happened, you know, be specific. But when you start throwing general allegations around, like, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm refuting it, but I don't even wanna spend too much time on it. So why does the group seem to have lost its luster? If you look at even what's happening with Oliver, considering the fact that, you know, um, he was, well, he was in detention for about 30 days, you know, and there was a lot of back and forth, even regarding which court to take him to. Even when he was arrested, it took like nearly 26 hours before he was allowed to even have access to a lawyer. These are, this, like, these are fundamental human rights, which were being denied of him. So I definitely think that there's always this um, urge for government to use the police, especially to kind of clamp down on us. I, I genuinely think that was one of those moments where the state's been waiting. We're just waiting for you to slip up and get you on something, just something. If the state genuinely had a case, why is it that most of the time when they get to the courtroom, the state prosecutor doesn't turn up, they're asking for more time. I think there's definitely people who think, who would not be as active or as vocal because, you know, the reality is that, you know, as Martin Amidou said, when you fight corruption, corruption fights back. And the, rea and the reality is that for a lot of people from jobs to contracts to, you know, certain opportunities, if you say the wrong thing about the government, even if you like the wrong post, these are things which can have opportunities. You can miss out on opportunities, lose out on job opportunities, lose out on scholarship opportunities. So yes, there are real life um, repercussions for speaking up against the government. And what's happening to Oliver is definitely going to make some people, a lot of people, feel like maybe I shouldn't be so vocal, maybe I need to stay, take a step back. Historian and scholar Kwame Dako Ankara agrees government might have been on the heels of the group. By bringing out some of the issues, issues of corruption, issues of, uh, let's say, mismanagement, incompetence and so on, can easily, have, can easily bring the government down or make the government unpopular. 
So the government and its supporters will also find ways and means to undermine this uh, 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 group so that whatever they say will not be what? Will not catch with, uh, catch, uh, w w w resonance with the people. So that is the specific uh, uh, issues with regard this group. What then has become of the group's ideals? If people are speaking up against the state, even if they hate Fix the Country, even if they hate me, if they hate Oliver, and they're speaking up against the state, look, what happened in Swami? They went on one. They did one, one day of him coming over and then showing him small Pepe. <laughs> Small Pepe. So the, the reality is that don't ever think you're not imp your voice doesn't matter. You just need to be mo you need to organize and be you if you have a unit and this all of you are saying the same thing, you can win. That's the thing. Fix the country is not about us. It's about the people. So once the people are out there going on their protests, you know, fighting for what they deserve, what is owed to them, is a win for me. It doesn't have to be under the guise or the banner of fix the country for it to be a win. It's never about personal glory, fix the country's glory. It's about we want Ghana to be better. Whether or not the Fix the Country group has been successful with its aim, its leaders, supporters and even rivals agree on one thing, that the struggle continues even if under a new banner name. Manuel Cranting, Joy News, Accra. Good morning, Ghana. For welcome back on the AM show, and we're about to hit, hit the nail on the head with my blunt thoughts for you this morning. This morning, I want us to reflect on our natural resources, failing to own what we possess, the vicious cycle of Ghana's scandalous poverty. My dear friends, having resources is one thing; properly valuing and managing them is another thing altogether. Guess what? For us on this continent, Africa, we have the second largest continent and the mineral industry of Africa is also the second largest in the world. Africa is richly endowed with mineral reserves and ranks first in quantity of world reserves of bauxite, cobalt, industrial diamonds, phosphate rock, platinum group metals, vermiculite and zirconium. African mineral reserves rank first or second for bauxite, cobalt, diamonds, phosphate rocks, and all of these metals that I have made mention of. All of them are present here in good quantity. In fact, the 2012 share of world production from African soil was 7% of bauxite, 5% of aluminium, 38% of chromite, which you would find in some Central African countries, copper at 9%, gold at 20%, iron ore at 2%, steel at 1%, and more. For natural diamonds, for example, it stands at 56%. The list could go on and on. But the question is, has our continent capitalized on all this, made the most of all of these resources? What has Ghana, for example, made of all its natural resources? Is the resource curse actively playing out here, where a country has vast natural resources but fails to properly harness it for real developmental purposes. In 2012, for example, Ghana exported $5.93 billion in gold, making it the 21st largest exporter of gold in the world, while getting, guess what, only 4% of that sum in royalties. This active royalty system, which has seen us accruing 3%, 5%, 7%, 10% and the like for our natural resources, and even 10% is on the high side, is part of what ails our economy and is causing the yawning deficits that often lead us right back, pan in hand, to the IMF. But even in Africa, some countries are doing better than others. Look at South Africa, which has managed to secure better terms for its value of gold. Look, in 2012, for example, in 2020, they exported gold worth $13 billion. How much did they get out of that $4 billion in revenue? That is about a third, if not more, of what they exported. And that is substantial. Look at us here. How much are we getting? A pittance, 4%, and yet we want to get development. That is where we ought to get to. 
the example of South Africa and other countries. Most of these multinational corporations operating here, mining our gold, taking our oil, exploiting them, I am sad to say, come to Ghana to explore and exploit our natural resources, cash in on them, and then cash out, repatriating most, if not all, of their returns outside of our economic jurisdiction. How then, I ask, do we expect to develop? Oil revenue uh, royalties rake in only about 4%. So I ask, has the royalty system in force helped Ghana, Nigeria, Africa as a whole? Some African countries, like I have stated, have secured better deals than others. But here in Ghana, how can we also get to that point? We also have the other side of the equation. Poor resource distribution, which has led to fighting and insurgency in Nigeria, for example. That should point to what this trend, if not remedied, can do. Just you take a look, good look at Obwasi and Takwa, mining towns. How best can you describe them but as ghost towns? Look at their hospital facilities, roads and all of that. Look at the western region and oil production. How much has it done for the people there? How has it directly benefited the people? These entities will do a little corporate social responsibility, and that's it. Yet they rake in billions that they are expatriating year in and year out. And our leaders sit down and watch and agree to these terms. Now, guess what? We also have lithium, a wonderful product that can be used for many purposes across the globe and which is sought after by many countries. And our leaders are greedily following the same vicious cycle of the past, which will lead to a royalty system that will only benefit a precious few. We are vainly and foolishly rushing headlong into another resource ambush. And our blind leaders cannot even see this to talk of read between the lines. Here's something you may not be aware of. It may, in fact, come as a big surprise to you. Are you aware that currently Ghana is now the world's biggest exporter of yam? Just take a look at this. In terms of global exports of yam in 2021, Ghana ranked first globally. If you take a good look at this, you would see that the top global exporters of yam in, in sum of millions of dollars, in sum of millions of dollars, actually has Ghana at the top with 48 million. Jamaica follows with 39 million. Then the USA, interestingly, with 22 million. Japan with 21 million. And China with 20. But I ask myself, on the back of this, what have we done? In fact, when you take a look at the next slide, you would see that in terms of millions of dollars, between 2016 and 2021, there has been quite a giant leap from $27 million in 2016 to 48.2, almost $50 million in 2021. But having achieved this, I am yet to see a plan, for example, concerning what we can do to sustain this, to ensure that now that we are at the top, we stay there and get even more hard currency for Ghana. What we should do is a quick SWOT analysis. We contemplate our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats in this industry. Weigh our new areas of export strength and factor it in on how to harness this to the full. As the economists will say, you figure out your niche areas and explore your comparative advantage and hone those areas. Guess what? We have comparative advantage here. But on the back of this, you'd think a country like Ghana, especially with our Planting for Food and Jobs program, would ramp up yam production by encouraging farmers and guaranteeing the buying of their produce to provide better storage facilities, contemplate value addition. But no, not Ghana. Lai Lai. Not with these leaders we have. Recently, there was talk of government not coming to the aid of yam Farmers. In fact, it was in the news on this very network where we shared with you different farmers from different parts of the country complaining about the fact that they had a yam glut. Why should that happen Where's for a country produced? that is at this level? So is government thinking of adding value to the yam tubers rather than just following the non-existing, uh, long-existing pattern with cocoa where we just exported the raw beans until we started processing them? In October last year, 
Farmers, yam farmers in the Northern Belt complained bitterly about various constraints that were severely impeding yam production. The farmers added that their problems were compounded by neglect of the sector by government. I can bet my bottom dollar not much is being done. And in a matter of years, if not by next year, we could slip from top spot, especially considering that we are facing our own feeding challenges for our own population by way of availability and cost. But before I go on, as you could see in your background, that was that report recently on yam farmers with vast stores of yam going waste. Why must this always be our script? The Malaysians got oil palm from us. Look today at their production levels. I ask, how can a country that up until last year had for three years running been Africa's biggest producer of gold, now only second to South Africa, a country which is the world's second biggest cocoa producer, a country with vast diamond, manganese, bauxite, timber, water, human and other resources end up in these dire economic straits and have to go to beg the IMF for a bailout. How? We have the very arable land. We've not capitalized on it. We have lithium now. As always, the looting brigade will, as we say here, do the most. And Ghana, mother Ghana, will be all the poorer, even with this new blessing. Now, we are doing big things with yam. But just you wait and see if the measures I speak of are not applied whether in the next two to three years we'd still be the world's top producer. We always fail to plan properly. And we all know that a failure to plan is a tacit plan to fail. So yes, yetisikaso and so okomfita enedien. Because we don't take advantage of what we have. And to make matters worse, our leaders do not only appear to be bereft of real transformational nation-evolving ideas, they also are venomously corrupt. This corruption has so blinded them that they cannot see beyond the noses of their own comfort. And to add to all that, to add even more insult to injury, our leaders tend to grow wings, starting to act all high and mighty and adopt this arrogant tone over time that is just sickening. This cuts across both the NDC and the MPP, which have had opportunities to rule in this fourth republic. But little wonder when leaders forget their true place that they are actually servants. Here, the reverse is true, because we've allowed it to be so. So you can have a finance minister who is flailing at post, whose policies are flopped, and whose ideas about an IMF bailout were sidestepped by his boss, the president, who would tell us that resigning would be like a father. Who, by the way, made him our father? Who told him we were his children? Would he treat his children the way we are being treated in this country? In any case, my father, may his gentle soul rest in peace, would not be anything like our finance minister had he been alive. That's for sure. But the arrogance doesn't stop there. You have a communications minister who very reluctantly, yeah, really, told us that she had to postpone the SIM re-registration deadline. Almost as though offering the crumbs of her patience, for which reason we, we had to be eternally grateful. You have a broken system that has cost people so much because of ineptness, and you have the effrontery to demean those same people? Someone better holler in the ears of these haughty ones that they are paid with our taxpayers' money, that they are there to work for us, not lord it over us. And of course, when you have such vain ministers whose hubris is so big, you cannot expect anything less from the appointor himself, can you? Do you recall that tweet? Many years ago, right before 2016, when President Ekofuado, now president, then in opposition, posted about Ghana going to the IMF and how for the first time a resource-rich country, a country that had discovered oil, was going to the IMF. I guess that benchmark, fellow Ghanaians, hasn't changed. But we are back, eager and ready to dance the economic tango once more with the IMF. And the CEO of the nation, President Akufuado tells us his government will get us the best possible deal from the IMF. It sounds like a double slap in the face. It is as though heading there for such a program were a feather in this government's cap. Or what ordinary Ghanaians would have expected from his administration. Can you imagine that? You see, Ghana Fu, if we are to go by his own cousin, Gabin, Gabi Ochridako's words many years ago, then this administration, without a shred of doubt, has been financially reckless. And through saying, 
brought our economy to its knees to the point where we need an IMF bailout. If the fundamentals were weak then, they must be weak now also for us to witness what we are. If the economic downturn that necessitated an IMF program was solely due to recklessness then, how can we paint this current ignominious turn with a different paintbrush? What's good for the goose, they say, is equally good for the gander. You know be so. So Ghana, for as we've reflected on all of these thoughts, I just want to, before I go to the slides, share with you something that Dr. Miles Monroe says about leaders. He says, the next time you meet any leader, ask them why they are there, what they mean to do with that position they occupy, what their aspirations are in the next two, three, four, five years. These are questions we ought to be putting to our leaders because guess what? A lot of them, I'm sad to say, are square pegs in round holes. They are there because we've contributed to the party and it's time for us to milk the system, for us to get our share of the booty. But in the end, who benefits and who loses? The few of them, the 3% who have power or the 97% of the masses who have practically nothing. I'd like you to take a look at this as we get ready to wrap the conversation. If you look at our royalties from oil, as I've pointed to you, since 2015 till now, it has indeed seen an increment. But when you look at the value of what we've been getting, like I painted the picture before, out of what? 5.1 plus billion in 2020, getting only 4%. That paints quite a picture. So from 384 million in 2015, we're getting something around 1.3 billion in 2021. And you would say, well, that is quite a good development. But in the end, is it worth it how much we are getting? I want to challenge our leaders this morning to take a second look at our royalty system. How can it be that we have all of these resources and yet we get these little percentages. How can we, in any good conscience, accept such situations? Because in the end, with all that is filtered out and the, the little that trickles in, we fail to build roads. We fail to deliver hospitals. Recently, Wache, we are told, died because of the no-bed syndrome. Who knows? That comedian, that actor's life could have been saved if he had had access to a hospital bed. We need better leaders who will get better deals for us, who will serve Mother Ghana in love and honesty. And until we get that, let's forget anything about making the strides to become a developed country, a developed economy. Which is why, as I end, I put this to you. Wherever you are, hold your leaders accountable. Do not look at your present situation thinking that maybe you are benefiting from their largesse. Because guess what? The tide could turn on you tomorrow. And if you enter a hospital and you don't get a bed, there will be no discrimination. The time to end the script, to end this tide of events, is now, not tomorrow. My name is Benjamin Akapu. These are my blunt thoughts for you this Friday morning, served raw, hot, and diluted. As always... God richly bless Ghana. Well, thank you for staying uh, with us on the AM show. I was just sharing my blunt uh, thoughts, but moving on from there, we have quite the conversation coming up. It's an interaction with the chairperson of the CPP, the Convention People's Party, Akusia Frimpoma Sapo. Now, it's interesting because the CPP thinks Osatifu, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, is being denigrated. Why? They also have quite some thoughts to share on the state of our economy and the trajectory of our country. Well, joining us, Akosia from Pomasapong will be sharing the thoughts 
of the CPP. Good morning. Good morning, great. It's wonderful to be here. And well, morning to all your viewers across the world. <laughs> right. It's a, it's a great pleasure having you. Great to be here. <laughs> so let's get into, we'll be getting into talk of uh, national life, everything that is happening from the economy to everything else. But let's start with Founders Day, which was just yesterday. Um, some say there's no difference. Founder apostrophe S or founder S apostrophe. And we've moved from September the 21st, which was, uh, you know, Nkrumah's birthday, to August the 4th, which also has its own significance as far as the UGCC is concerned. But the question is, on the back of Founders Day, why is it that you feel the Osajifu is being denigrated? Thank you. The first question should be why? Why? If it's just, if there wasn't, if it's not significant, why the apostrophe change? Mm. And if you change the apostrophe, why change the date? Mm. So you have not just a problem with the founders becoming founders, as in, in the plural form, you also have a problem with the change of date. Yes, because at the end of the day, what was the point, though? We have a lot of issues to uh, look at in the country. Um, there's history, and we all know, even if yesterday is gone, just yesterday, the history, there's nothing you can do about it. You can only do what you do today and then change the future. Mm. But when it's done, it's done. So when it comes to history, you ch every one of us have our place in history. That's what I think. Mm. Every one of us. Is, 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 is Kwame Nkrumah being robbed of, of that history, completely. do you think? And, and, and why? why? Why trying to squeeze everybody into his cloth? Why trying to squeeze people into his space? Every one of us have a space and a place in history. Mm. When something is so clear and glaring at you, mm. and you twist it, and you try to change it, then it feels like you've twisted history. Mm. And when you twist history, it would have to be straightened because that's not why everybody has his place. We all know my Busia, Dankwa, all of them, they have their place. Mm. And we all know where their place is. But when you try to change founders and make it, you might feel like others contributed and definitely others contributed. Mm. How far do you want to go with the contribution? Or Saji for himself, who clearly that one you can't dispute. That's mm -hmm. why I'm saying we all have our place in history. Was the father and the person that negotiated the independence with a political party, and that party you can't change it to be, make it into UGCC, was CPP. <clears throat> and that Convention People's Party, if you want to go that far and take it from the 30, 21st September, then leave it at where it started, which is the, um, the 12th of June, 1949. But when you go back to 4th August, 4th August, 1947, what's the point? Mm. You understand? You're just trying to create history when it didn't happen that way. We all so, so is it all politics at play? Absolutely. Because yesterday, somebody called in, and Nana Obri mm. said, why should CBP be talking? Because after all, we don't have parliamentarians. And so in other words, if we had parliamentarians in, in parliament, it wouldn't have gone through. That, that's clearly what it means, because it was, it was a parliamentary decision. It wasn't mm. anything that the people of Ghana said, let's change, because the people of Ghana know the history. Right. And here is the point. UGCC is United Gold Coast. That was during, before Ghana. Mm. The Gold Coast map, and the Ghana map is different. Mm. Who, who, who do you After the plebiscite, them? right. You understand? Mm. So you cannot, you cannot go that, that far. It, it's just but, like, but, 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 but is it not mere semantics? It, it, it is the same, yes, you could talk about uh, Transvolta Togoland being added to Ghana, but it's the same uh, more or less geographical boundary that is Ghana today, which was the Gold Coast. The, the, the nation Ghana, mm. the nation Ghana is not the same as the or as with the Gold Coast, mm. as it is today. I agree. But I'm so, saying that, so when you by and large, what was representative of Ghana, uh, or the Gold Coast then, is, is by and large what we see in Ghana today. 
that's my point though. The point I'm making though is that when you are talking about a founder of a nation, mm. you must look at the picture. You cannot just deduce that, oh, some people thought that yes, it should have been A, B, C, D. At the time of independence, mm. who said it should, we should wait? Who said we should have, who was begging the white, the, the, the queen not to give us the independence at the time? That was that really what happened? Because it was simply, you know, a contest of two ideas. Those saying self-government in the shortest possible time, mm -hmm. which was the rest of the members of the UGCC. Okay. And Koma who was saying self-government now, which difference? led him to go and form the CPP. Please, uh, let's look, let's, let's, today you are here, I'm here, okay? Because it's happened, you might think it would have happened. Where is uh, uh, African Union? Where is it? Mm. You remember? It's now the AU. No, no. So where is AU? Mm. Um, outside paper, where is AU? Mm. Do you have AU? Mm. Do you have any unity? Even in ECOWAS, do you have unity? Mm. Can you even get here for, to go to Togo and go anywhere without any, any, any boundaries? The point I'm making is that independence now and independence gradually makes a huge difference mm. between us not having united Africa. As to compare, on the day that Osadifu stood at the United Nations, and spoke about unity. Africa must unite. If you look at the passion and what he said, it was clear that he was ready and he thought we should be ready then. Mm. And some people thought it should be ready and gradual. And the same way today, we don't have it. I'm telling you that the mental, it's the belief system. It's what you think as at that time that makes you take a step. But, but, and you know what? Mm. You see what you discussed today. Right. You see what you spoke about. Mm. How Ghana is where it is, even in terms of our resources. It's because there's some people who think that we are not capable, that we should wait for the Christ person to train us, to get us ready, to give us what we need because we can't do it by ourselves. Mm. And because of that belief system, you would always go back there to ensure that give the person your gold, your diamond, because they are better. They have the risk, they have the, the machinery. But if you think for one moment and realize that you are capable, you notice that the gold that you have is even more powerful than the equipment. And therefore, you cannot and should not make any arrangement that does not give you a much higher portion of your gold or your oil. You can't, but you can only do that if you don't believe in yourself, if you think, and it's psychological. And of course, so, recently we were talking about, the, Mr. President was talking about, you know, uh, how much it cost us uh, being colonized and how we need reparation to be, to be done. I don't know what your take is on that because I feel that where we've got to, uh, reparation likely would not come, at least from the trajectory we've seen from these Western and Eastern powers that came here and colonized Africa in the first place. And, and I don't even feel that it's something we should be touting too loudly because no amount of reparation can repair the damage that was done to us over the centuries of you know, colonial rule. But let, let's, let's quickly look at this. The founder's cake, though, let's imagine that we have a cake and it's for all the founders. Is it not big enough to accommodate? And I'm going to try to recall all the members of the Big Six. We have them on our city notes. They share a spot on our CD notes without fighting. So uh, if, I recall, the, if I recall correctly, we have Ebenezer Akweje, we have William Oforiata, we have Emmanuel Obechebilamte, we have JB Dankwa, we have Edward Akufuado, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. They were together, they are on our CD notes. There's no fighting in there, there's no contestation. So why can't we have a founder's as a what happened to his, his face on the two cities? Listen, if we can't see what is happening clearly, what happened to his face on the two cities? They are already on the, in the on, like you said, the founders are there. Why squeeze him again to the day that has been at question for him as the founders' day for Ghana? Why change the apostrophe? Why change the date to, listen, but like they've said, like the argument has been made. In fact, some have even gone on to say that even outside of this number. There are so many people, like the woman we see on the 50 Peswa coin. Precisely. And many others who contributed in immense ways. For those who may not know, during the Nkrumah era, even before he won, became leader of government business and all of that, a lot of these women, with their resources, Absolutely. helped. Else, the CPP would not have been the CPP. Absolutely. And the youth so, so, well. so, I mean, if we want to pursue this argument, we could go ad nauseum, Oh, this person must be added. That person must be added. That person and would never end the list. And that's exactly the point you are making, though. That's mm. the point we are making. Mm. Therefore, so we should no just stay with Nkrumah. 
that's exactly we, we stay with the person with whom the whole thing started and ended with. That's why that it started and ended with him. It should have, there's always a, a starting point with life. Mm. Your father, your grandparents, and everyone, mm. including the people who fed you and the people who clothed you. But no idea starts with one person. Right. But it is someone who, at a point in history, is standing there when it's handed over. Mm. and the picture was taken. Mm. Now you won't just take that picture out and squeeze in other people who told him to go and stand there. It doesn't work that way. There's a place for everyone. So you recognize those people. Look at what is going to happen now at the mausoleum. The mausoleum is a commerce place where he's been buried. Right. And it is a place dedicated and reverence for him. It's been, it's been left to, to rot, sort of. Now you find money to uh, renovate. You are now asking to bring everybody on board for, for, for what? Mm. So that, why can't you create a place for the other people? I'm saying And so the Nkrumah mausoleum must be about Nkrumah, uh, reflecting the name it bears. Reflecting the name it bears plus the, the, the reverence that it is for that place. Mm. And we should not now try and squeeze in everybody else. I don't even think that if we can consult our ancestors, they want that. It's not necessary. Some have said that, you know, bringing in all the others, some of whom, you know, counted, dogged Nkrumah at every turn, some of whom allegedly tried to kill him. You remember the bombing in Kulungugu and other things is, is a travesty. Absolutely. As far as, do, do, are you, do you and, agree and, with and that? And it's the same mentality. The mentality is that anything in Nkrumah, it, and even including the books. Look at the textbooks that we had to fight before the lady pulled some of them and out. I was, I was about to get into that. Yes. Everything in Kuma now has to be placed at the, at the back burner. They want to make sure that they... Who are they? The, you, the, I mean, the UP, we know who they are. Mm. They, we know the current government. The, who, who was the one that actually helped to get in Kuma's name there? There's nothing they can do. I, I, you know, that's what I'm saying. When you twist history, yeah, it will be straightened. This is twisting history to just because you have the power. When you have power, you're not supposed to use it to sit on people. You're supposed to use that power to lift the others that you can. Everybody has its place. In Kroma, you cannot squeeze down Kwabuzia and everybody into the space of a study for. I don't even think they would have done that if they were alive. Is it only about founders? Is there no other ways and other uh, areas that we can teach what these people also did? because they are all our fathers who also contributed to Ghana as we have it today. But why say they founded Ghana when they did not? Mm. Why say and they so founded the, Ghana the, the, when the, they did the, not? Their contributions should be what, overlooked? No, no, no. Be placed but we where should, it is. We should give them a different yes. recognition. Basically. Recognition, because they are not what you want to force them to be. It is not just only about founders. Indeed, now that they forced these founders into the space, okay, and some group are saying no, because it's not the, 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 the populace that did that. What's going to happen when you are not there? And I was about to ask even, you know, progressively, moving forward, yes. and, and there are more Nkrumah-inclined political parties in our dispensation. Yes. I mean, that is to say, for example, that if your party, the CPP, secured power, the reins of power in 2024, you would basically try to undo everything they've done. No, we won't undo everything, but we will straighten that history. We like, not, like, like what? We, we will not say these are all found. They are not founders. I mean, for goodness sake. So at least that would change. That if would a change. CPP government came. Oh, absolutely. That would change. That would change. Would and you revert to September 21? Or would you go to the 12th of June? That I couldn't sit here and say, but we, we would definitely reverse to, I'm sure it should reverse to what it was before. Which is September 21. Yes. That was what it was. Mm. Why change it? Why make it a memorial day and make this one a holiday? What is the point? They could have created a holiday for the big six in a different context, not necessarily as the founders, because they are not the founders. Some people say that, and when you go to South Africa, it is undisputed how much reverence they pay to Madiba, Nelson Mandela. When you go to other countries, it is the uh, same. I mean, the Chinese and Chairman Mao and others, they, they all have... Yeah. Yeah, right, right. Exactly, exactly. Even Patrice Lumumba. Yes. They all have reverence for specific leaders. But some would also say that there is the touristic aspect of it and selling your own. You don't go to South Africa without wanting to, you know, go to, is it Robben Island? And, and, you know, find out what happened to Madiba there, among other things. 
Here in Ghana, some go as far as saying that by, like what you say, denigrating Nkroma, we are cutting short our potential, even in terms of tourism, in terms of how we could sell the man Nkroma, the, the man of the 21st century, by the way, according to that BBC Africa poll. And I'll just add this. I went to, before you share your thoughts, I went to Ouagadougou uh, in Burkina Faso many years ago, and I, was, I found it rather curious that an entire a major road like the Kemba Motorway was actually dedicated to the man Kwame Nkrumah. For you, what does this mean when it comes to what the, the impact, negative impact could be of, of what you think is happening? Um, first of all, let's look at the parts of uh, tourism. The idea for turning the museum into a memorial park into Nkrumah's museum is now because of tourism. You don't need to bring all of them there to make it a tourist center. You just need to improve it and create another center. Mm -hmm. I saw the cathedral space is there. So you can create, take a portion of that cathedral space. It's also in a very good location. And put the you other... You mean the National Cathedral? That's my point. That space from the National Cathedral is there. And it's, it's a nice location. And it's a central location. It creates a space there for any other tourist uh, attraction that you want to have with the other uh, uh, six, or including the six, so that if you think in Kuma's name is what will attract people there, then add his name everywhere else. But don't change where he, his line. Don't change where he's been buried. Don't change his monument. His monument. Don't change what it is. Mm. Because I know that leaders who come to this country and the one place they want to go is go to the Nkrume uh, Museum. Mm. So why change that? So I agree with you. I really don't think, uh, I think it's the mentality and that petty, there's, there's a certain triviality that we are putting to things that are not necessary. Instead of us getting up to do what we can do for ourselves, think of what can, I can do to improve something. You are always thinking of what somebody else has and how you can take that thing away from that person. It's not, it's not a good thinking. Mm. It's not a good thing. The Nkoma is gone. He's already made his contribution. Nobody can change it. Yes, he came to join UGCC. Yes, he left. If he had not left, maybe we still not. We still have been like um, South Africa. It would have taken us about 50 years. All the before, way into the 90s. Before mm. we would have gotten our independence. Like we don't have anything for uh, African Union today. But some would also tell you on the reverse, on the flip side, that look at South Africa today and that partly by, and, and this is not, you know, an opinion that I share, but at least we must look at all the dynamics, that on the back of, you know, remaining in that situation for so long, they are far more advanced now. Is that something you can dispute? Oh, my God. Absolutely. When I hear such statements, it's so sad. Then what about Rwanda? Right. Why wouldn't we use the current one that we know that an African has done? Mm. No. Absolutely no. That is not the truth. The fact is that when you go to South Africa, there are more Af the Africans who live in poverty. Look at the way they bring themselves. Is that the kind of world that we want? Look Xenophobia. At the, yes. Look at the way they do it. Look at the way they treat others. Mm. It, it, do you love yourself? Is that what it is? Listen. But, but that is not a general reflection of South Africa. It's actually no, 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 but, of what no, happens no, no, no. But in is, a small portion of South but Africa. But it is a very important reflection that shows you what the people have gone through in the past. Mm. You understand? Mm. So you cannot take today and ignore what has happened in the past. The thinking of people, who they think they are, is what they do. Right. So I will never... Ever. And that is why our father said it is better to, to, to what's the statement again? Something about servitude in tranquility than. Right, uh, right. He said self governance in danger mm. than servitude in tranquility. Right. We must manage our own things. If you can change, if you can't think that way, you would always go to IMF. If you can't think that way, you would never think that you sign a contract, that the lithium you have, you would give it out. If you can't think that way, you can't think that you are equal or even better than the Chinese. I'm just saying something here. You can't think that you are equal or even better than the American mm. or better than the Japanese or the, 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 the British. You think that they have made it so they, they are always going to be ahead. Life does not work that way. Mm. You have, once you have the resources and you have the human resource as well, the sky and the earth, the difference is what you are thinking. Mm. The difference is what you believe you are, who you are. Mm. It is not just about, you must have that deep conviction that you are capable. And that is what I'm sitting here talking about. And you feel our leaders don't have that conviction? They don't. If they did, how can you, within a month 
or less than a month, say that going to IMF is a da will be a da situation for Africa, for Ghana, and that we are never going, and that we won't go, and then we find ourselves there. It means that something is very, very wrong with, with um, you, we might know it's wrong, but our belief system, what we, what, what we end up signing and thinking and saying has very little to do with our deep convictions. And I believe that somehow that is why, you see, when you have the wrong policies, the policies that you bring together, you put out there, has to do with what you think and where you want to get to mm. and your own vision. Mm. The policy of, 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 of private sector being the engine of growth, mm. that uh, property owning democracy, right. is a nice thing. Mm. We all, I want to be wealthy, but when you look at the bigger picture, when a nation is poor, when a nation has no wealth, right. that nation, and the nation opens its door for free trade, and then other nations that are rich, that can give their, their citizens cheaper money with very little interest and more money, will come and take over everything you have. That's why we're giving out our gold. That's why we're giving out our, our, dime, uh, our, our bauxite. We're giving out, we are going to give out our lithium if you have it. We are giving out our oil. We're giving out even our talk time, even our data. Mm. Look at what is happening today. Clearly, these people do not have it. They don't understand. They don't understand that as a nation, we ourselves must be rich. And that we are already blessed. It is a So me, I really think that this country is not going to go nowhere. We are still going to go back forth, back and forth, backwards, forward, backwards, forward, as we're doing. And so the day that we realize that we can do it, we are capable. And that, that means that when you make that statement, take steps. All right, let, let's, let, let me hold you on that. Let's talk about broader governance issues because, of course, we all recall what uh, this administration told us, that they have the men and, by extension, Clearly, they don't the have women. the women. And, by extension, the women. No, really. They have about... about <laughs> they have the men, yeah, I believe, but they don't have the women. Clearly, that's... But, but, but you could also say that they used that in a ge generic sense. I mean, even the Bible does that. No, when know, it says man, it doesn't. <laughs> but, but let's look at some points you've made um, on the National Cathedral, the IMF program, and, and we'll talk about other matters. I, I think I'll re reserve the, the bit about the National Cathedral for later. But let's talk about general governance issues. And I'll start from here. If you had to... I do this often, so pardon me. If you had to assess the MPP administration, and we've done this before, I want to know whether there's any change. From 2016 till now, it's been some six years, almost six years. How would you rate it in terms of performance across the board? Um, the only lack MPP has is the, for me, is that me as a person, this is not even me as a political party. I'll give them a four instead of maybe a two. Simply because... So you would have given them two, but you'll give them a four? Yes. Out of ten? Yes, because of uh, uh, the SHS. Because of free because, SHS? Yeah, because they continued with the Osage Force policies. Mm. Because they continued with the CPP policy of free SHS and education. Because I believe so much in education, and I believe so much that every young person and everybody must be given opportunity to, them for, 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 to become, for, to, to, to maximize their potential. You understand? So for me, it's one of those things. I say it's, it takes everything for me. Mm. However, from day one, I knew they had messed up when they, 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 on the decision they did with their banks. I just couldn't believe it. I, I, you mean I, the banking sector clean up? I, I, absolutely. I thought that was the most, I said, personal vendetta. Mm. You know, you could see that somebody was going after somebody and did not think. And in the process, can't believe the amount of money that they put to clean up the city. I don't even We've expended about 21 billion recently. We were told about uh, another 8 billion, billion. would go I into mean, that. It's not about clean up. They messed up. If we say clean up, it's like there was already a mess and you clean. No, there might have been some issues. There was a simpler way. How could they have done it? You have intelligent young people like you and others who are in the uh, banking sector. Okay? You want, you, you clearly think there's a problem. The, it is the, the, it's the directors that you might have had issues with, mm. not the workers at the bank. Why didn't you bring people in 
who would work with them, give them money there, and force them, if they use their minds to be there to create the solution, the problems, they should be able to solve the problem. Let them work. But you took them off the hook. You took all of them and then closed down the most of the microfinance that was taking care of the petty, petty traders. And you don't have the the resources or even the, 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 the system to reach the petty traders. So in the process, you've just given money. That is the worst, for me, the worst crime or whatever they've done. That is, is so, is, is, is horrific, that decision. And we've made mention of the fact that, uh, yes, even the finance minister has accepted that it has, you know, even impacted where we are now. When recently at the Accra Business School, we heard from Vice President Dr. Baumia. He made mention of the fact that apart from COVID-19, the Russo-Ukrainian war, two other factors that had really impeded our work. Um, first of all, what we are paying to the IPPs, the independent power producers, excess energy, and what we have to cough up for that, and the banking sector cleanup. That's a big so, so, at least from that angle, we know that it's contributed to where we are, but. Some also say that without this, the situation could have been far worse. In fact, Nigeria, for example, also had its own banking sector cleanup, though slightly different from what we did. But like the governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ernest Addison says, it was necessary. To do what? Yes, necessary to support the banking sector. But how, how you do it makes a difference. That's my point. My point is like... The, the way they did so it. was targeted, basically. That's my point. It was political. That's what you're saying. Yes. And in the process, affected, they took several other decisions that they shouldn't have taken, especially the microfinance. Why didn't they support the microfinance people with funding? Because most of them were private sector, young, small, small, small private sectors that were helping people. I know personally people who were in that sector who currently today are free because they were owing money, but they were also quite smart. So if you had given them loan and put some kind of um, management to work with them, you'd have created jobs with those management groups and then also made them work to pay off the money. But to take them off the hook and say you pay the, 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 the creditors, uh, uh, not the creditors, the, yeah, the, 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 the depositors, okay? And they knew that before. So most of them just cook the books. Listen, listen, that was a major failure. I don't care how, how they sit down there and try to justify it. I'm sure. And, and maybe, and it's possible they don't even know. Mm. They don't even know that that wasn't what they should have done. Mm. What they did with the banking sector is one of the, it's not, if it's not the major reason, eh, might be like 90% the reason why, why we are where we are today. Because Ghana is about petty traders. Ghana is not, uh, it's only a small chunk of, of Ghanaians are hired by government or even into any other. Most of, most Ghanaians employ themselves. And they employ themselves through the support of these microfinance. So you must only improve it and make the interest better for them with government funding. If that 20 billion had gone to support private sector, small, 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 do you know the kind of jobs that it will, it's rolled over to, the kind of income that it generates and all that? I, I, I really don't think these people really got it. The, the, the economic team completely, completely lost it with that one. Completely let, lost let, it. let me ask you, uh, staying on management matters and the economy specifically, we have inflation that stands at around, at the last time, 29.8%. Uh, utilities are due to go up on September the 1st. The CD has lost about 20.7% of its value uh, since January, about another 7% in recent times. And there's a whole lot more. When you look at our economy, I know you're a business person as well. What picture do you see? And do you feel like some have suggested that Ken Oforiata, finance minister, should bow out. That's exactly the point I made. That looking at the economy, I mean, as for the numbers, when I hear them, I laugh because very soon NDC is also going to come and tell us some numbers and that they brought. And all the numbers do not reflect in the lives in the, in the, of the people. I'm surprised when you hear these numbers in the US or other countries, people's lives have improved. In Ghana, 
you would understand. You would, IMF, but, but the so U.S. is also seeing some of the worst no, no. inflation. No, no, I understand. Know, when in, they say in decades, they, that's the point I'm making. That when you hear that there's inflation, or it has, they, they, they've been able to reduce inflation. It's, it's, it reflects in the lives of the people. Mm. It reflects in the salary they make. It reflects in the payments of things. In Ghana, all these numbers don't do much. The, right now, where we stand. If they've doubled it to 29 point something now, almost 29, almost 30, it's like twice as much within this time. It's scary. The, the, if you look at the debt, how much we owe, it's scary. I'm not saying that everything is just on the head of NDP, um, MPP. No, it's been for like that for a while. NDC. So, for example, the NDC also has a role to play. They, they, share, they should share in the burden of what is happening now. Absolutely. What did MP, 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 NDC do with the, the oil industry, mm. energy? What happened? They were importing finished goods, yet we had all there. We had, and uh, they took over from um, the, the MPP. So we would have expected that at least we'd have been producing and, uh, our own, processing the oil here, but we didn't. So for me, it's the oil, same oil still isn't functional. It's still, it's still not functional. The, um, the factories that collapsed still are not functional. So for me, I really don't think these people have the solution. And, mm -hmm. and if you uh, tell me, if there's something called dire situation, I, what we see, I see happening in Ghana very soon, we should now go back to Operation Feed Yourself. Immediately, we should focus on agriculture. Everything else we are going to do would not help us. All this, we should leave this macro economy uh, uh, decision making between Ghana and IMF, now that we've gone to IMF, okay? Because they will try to help with, 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 with us controlling our expenditure and all those things. But we should immediately focus on the micro, mm. on the sub-micro as well. We should focus on how do we get Ghana to work? Because these people are not going to get us to work. And the only way I see it immediately is to focus on agriculture. Let's make sure that we put energy, money, and everything in agriculture. Let's not talk about food and job, which is exactly what agriculture is and we don't understand. Let's talk about operation feed yourself. So talking, that, but, but, but how can you do that without planting for food and jobs, which you are referencing now? I yes. mean, if a champon, if Kutue Champong could do it, and I know some people during his regime, I was, Dr. I was, Abudu I was, I, and okay. others who, who made that happen. Um, why can't we, why, why can't PFFJ do it for us now? What's the name? What, what's say it again? Planting for food and jobs. <laughs> What is that supposed to be? You touch them, I see them, I see it. You plan for food and job. Without saying it, the farmer, that's the job for the farmer. Without saying it, when I eat kinky, it is because somebody has planted. You see, there are some slogans and some statements that you, you make. It gets people to do things. When you tell me you're pushing, feed yourself. Me, myself, it tells him that I should feed myself. So my farm, the, 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 the garden in our home was turned into tomatoes and plant, uh, everything. We saw it as a pride. We were, and there was no empty land, you understand? If you had land and you didn't use, anybody could come and plant on it. That was part of the whole operation, feed yourself. So I'm saying that, yes, yeah, some statements, uh, it, it doesn't bring a paradigm shift. It doesn't make people change their thinking or their behavior for that matter. Mm. So this one, planning for- So would you say- uh, yeah, would you but say that, that, Uncle Baby, uh, but for Tinti and Kobe, yeah. Kobe would, you, yeah. would you say that that, that entire uh, concept, which we've had for quite a number of years and invested so much money in, has not lived up to expectation then? No, because yes, yes, remember what the minister said, that the reason why food prices have gone up and we can't see what the, any uh, food out there is because of middlemen. Middlemen were there before I was born and they will continue to be there. And when you know that middlemen are going to be there, that's why you do uh, kind of food, food, food uh, not only focus on farming, but also on the food distribution. And that's why we had food distribution. That's why we had, uh, we had factories that were going to absorb the farming produce. If you don't do all that chain system and you leave it and you, you, you focus on uh, food and job and you don't focus on the food, because I have to consume the yam. Like you were saying today, how am I going to get a yam in Accra? You didn't focus on that. You are now trying to plant, uh, build, build, give, give contract for warehousing. You see, let me tell you where government goes very wrong. You take a minister like the Minister for Agriculture, very nice person, I'm sure he has his own yeah. uh, vision and things. Dr. Apotefi. Yes. Right. Yet, you put him in that area, and what happens is, He's, he, he ends up 
given trying to build the, the um, warehouse. He's trying to do everything along the chain. It is all government. They are trying to do A to Z. Mm. Meanwhile, they call themselves the private, uh, 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 private sector and demo, uh, property, property owning, owning democracy. Mm. Yet they don't really work with the private sector in, uh, in a way that doesn't benefit them. So, so, so I get the point you're making that even in trying to execute all of these, they are doing it from a very central point, and that which, is, which creates problems because like with, with the American version of the capitalist enterprise or property owning democracy, government only gives you the channels and leaves private enterprise to basically and, and run the show. That's what you have. Yeah, gives you the channel and the support system. So here, here, here you have the farmer. Now, the, listen, look at what happened in the private sector with education. Because education was opened up, now everywhere somebody opens up, one is you have a okay, soul clinic, you have this, you have that, and everybody is running their own private sector. Government is not the one telling them what to do. Government is not giving the contract to build a school. You, you get my point. So now, in the education uh, 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 area, we don't have any problem with, with, with education in terms of quality education for your, for, of your choice. You come to the farming. If they had left it to the point where people could plant and they give them funding and they could have also build the, the all these young people were giving funding to build the, the what do you call it the warehouse and things. They don't need they don't need to put major 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 warehouse like the silos we're putting together in Tema mm. before we can get the yam to that location for me to buy at a price that is right for me. They should work with private sector and it should not just be an MPP person. It should just be the private sector. It should be most of these things, the decision must be taken by the business people right. who know what they are doing. The and, 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 and that is what we often say, the private sector being the engine of growth. But uh, I mean, just to be fair as well, if you look at some of the data, what I put on the screen earlier, sharing my blunt thoughts, you would look at how much we had exported between 2016 and 2021, around 27 million dollars worth of yam tubers in 2016 and now we are looking at 48.2 is it government so, so it may not necessarily be that but you cannot also take away the fact that uh some policies may also be feeding into these developments but the point is how much can we do this better to ensure that now that we are number one exporter for example we can sustain that so i get i get your point but let's 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 come back to another aspect of our national life, which has to do with the IMF program. Because like it or not, these programs always come with some conditionalities, some uh, matters we're going to have to deal with, which means that everybody is going to endure some discomfort. Bloomberg told us recently that we were the second uh, country, uh, rather sadly, with the highest risk of debt distress in the world, apart from El Salvador. When you look at the IMF program that we are going for, you look at our debt situation, our debt to GDP. You look at the fact that we need sustainability when it comes to our debt management and all of those dynamics. What would you want to see out of an IMF program? This would be the 18th time. And like the likes of Professor Bokpin of the University of Ghana Business School and others have said, if we don't get the right measures in place, we would go a hundred times and still be readying ourselves to go back. What, what, what do you want to see? And perhaps what would the CPP do differently in this situation? Currently where we are, we don't have a choice. It's just like when um, the first, when President Kufo went to HIPIC, it was a matter of definition. We're already in HIPIC. When you, have, when you owe so much, the, the debt to, the, 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 the revenue that we collect in this country compared to how much we owe in terms of how much we have to pay. It's way, it's almost like more than even the amount that we collect. And in 2025, I think in about the next three years, most of our, 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 our payments would have ballooned. And at that point, there'll be so much that we need to pay. So I believe that all I want to see here is that once we've gone to IMF, surely we are hoping that they would, they would help with the with, with, with the leakages in the system, or maybe they would, they would ask us to control expenditure and they would supervise that. So we might not have that free fall of expenditure that we, we, we were doing. So that one might help us for you and I who don't know what is happening there. But when you talk about IMF, you know that that is not going to solve our problem. 
Mm. It is only for resuscitation. Right. It's just that we are in emergency and we need some kind of um, oxygen. So me, that's the way. I don't care how they. So that's the way I see it. So it's going to help us in the way that we don't have a choice in terms of the policies that we have. But we must take steps. If we don't and repeat what we've been doing, we will still go back to IMF. CPP will stop going to IMF. And the, the, the first step we'll take... A CPP I'll, government would stop going to I'll IMF. I'll show you two things that we'll do that will stop taking us to IMF. The first thing we'll do, and in fact three, the first thing we'll do is focus on agriculture. As mm -hmm. I just told you. Okay. And make sure that anybody who plants is in our manufacturer anyway. No farmer would sell their produce. That's it would all be routed through what? That statement that no farmer sells their produce means that you need to take some steps. And the first step is to make sure that every farmer's produce is put on a platform. So we know that you are planting tomatoes. But as long as we say yes, plant the tomatoes, it must be bought by government. Mm. When I say government, government then would work with the youth like all the other youth in place and give them the funding and uh, support system so that they will be able to buy the tomatoes and process it and bring it somewhere and make the canned tomatoes and make the, can the tomato flour and tomato whatever. So we have to focus on agriculture and so that we can consume and export like the way we've done with the yam. We must do that mm. so that we do not go back to IF. Number two, we must go back to the joint table and renegotiate our mineral resources. Like we, I was talking about in my absolutely, there's no royalty system. We, we have no choice. We, we, we must go back to talk to IMF, World Bank, all the international organizations that say that they are trying to help us. Let them help us in ways that make sense. These companies are coming from there. We must, Ghanaians must get up and renegotiate. If we don't renegotiate it, then we must as well close them and let them be there. Even if it means that we need to give them one year of not working, that's what we do, that's what we do. But we must renegotiate the royalties. We shouldn't take anything less than uh, 40%. And then after five, 10 years, we should have 60% or more. Mm. Then it should work to the next 10 years, we should have 80% of our... Mean but, but, but it's not mere talk. Um, no, no, it, no, no. It, no, it's, no. Also about, it's also about the clout you come with. When you look at the different dynamics, oftentimes you want to exploit these resources, but you don't have the means of doing that. And that is where the what challenge means? is. Where, where is the the economic means. Look at our oil, for example. We, <laughs> we simply didn't have the know-how at the time. We didn't have the, the resources to do this. That is why we invited we the all those to, entities in please, there. We don't have the know-how to even print the daily graphic. We don't even have the know-how to do this. What I'm saying is that we still buy the equipment. People, private sector, go buy equipment. They buy paper. And with their knowledge of putting information on there, they roll out and we can now buy, uh, have access to the daily graphic. You understand? Yeah. We don't have the know-how to do the equipment. But yet today, somebody sitting in the house watching TV. Mm. It is about negotiation and what you think you are bringing to the table. Right. We don't think that we are capable. If you... How, what sense does it make for me to have my gold, my oil, my diamond, my everything, and then you? You only have equipment and know-how. What is know-how? Mm. Know-how is knowledge. Are we saying that we can't get engineers? Are we saying that, do you know the private Ghanaians who are working in success outside this country? Who, have us, who can really run these institutions? And why can't we hire them? Good question. Let, let's, let's wrap the conversation on these uh, quick points. Um, I'll bring in the National Cathedral maybe as the penultimate one. And maybe I would like, especially as I know you're a feminist, you're, you're, you're passionate about women's affairs, to just talk briefly about the Sarah Adwasafo situation and what is happening. But before that, before those two, you spoke about the banking sector cleanup earlier. Uh, I, there's also the factor of corruption. In fact, per the latest Ghana Statistical Service Shraj UNODC report, we lost about five billion to corruption last year. Uh, the Afrobarometer report puts the executive at the second institution when it comes to corruption, which which is interesting because you have the the Ghana Police Service atop that list. You have the executive, then you have the legislature and the judiciary, second, third, fourth. But let's focus on the executive. They are in power, so to speak. How much of a problem do you have with corruption and how do we stem the tide? How, how would your, your government, in case you came to power, for example, deal with corruption? When we come to power, now. And be, be, be a bit brief on that. Very, so very brief. Exhaust um, the other, the other In 2000 and 
15, I gave a solution to the government, MPP, NDC, how we stem this corruption. Technology is the solution. You cannot leave it free as we have it and expect that you... When a police officer owns a property that he built in three years, in four years, or a custom officer owns a car that you know that the salary couldn't have afforded it, do you let it go? When a parliamentarian immediately or a minister builds a house, oh, this is the house of a parliamentarian, we know that. Do we let it go? When our dear friend died and we looked at the will, this... Are you, are you referring to... Sir no, Tom? I don't want to mention his name because he's my sweetheart. So... Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, and I'm a traditionalist, so we don't talk about the entire negative. So the point is that at the end of the day, those, those properties were not registered somewhere. Mm. I gave a solution that we would use technology. Technology that would, first of all, every property in Ghana would be re-registered. Every property every in Ghana property. would be re-registered? Re-registered. And the ones that would not be re-registered means that government can use it and give it to people. So government will take over that property? And give it to people to own. I mean, to stay in. But every property. So if you own property, just show us how you paid for it. That's all. If you can't show us how you paid for it. I mean, that, 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 that would be a, uh -uh. a rather curious way of going about this situation. Which other because way because then a lot of people could maybe not show you how exactly they acquired no, no, this no, no, over no. time. No, no, no. Don't show me how. But no, no, not show us how. Show us. I'm talking about uh, your, what do you call it, your taxes. That's all. Hmm. So if you can, then go pay it. You understand what I'm saying? Right. So maybe you have to sell one to pay for the two that you own. That's a starting point. Mm. So if you own 300 and you are a lawyer, and you own five properties, and I can't see how the income that you've made to own that property, then it means that for the, year, for the years you have not paid government, somehow you've made money corruptly or something. So you have to, listen, we cannot treat corruption with, with case gloves. We can't. Mm. And keep saying it. What is the point? In every day we are number one, and then MPP will come and say the same thing. NDC will come and say the same thing. I gave a solution to NDC. NDC took it for two years. They approved it. Before we could do it, they lost power. I gave it to this government. They haven't used it. There is a solution. We use IT. Do you feel this government is not as willing to fight corruption? Either they don't know or they are not. Which is which? Um, which is it? Maybe both. See so me, I don't like to attack people personally because the person might not even know, have no, have no clue. But they are just going by the system that they've come to meet. President Akufuado said he would use the ANAS principle. Uh, we've not seen that. Uh, recently I interacted with... You see, ANAS with, principle we, is a I interacted with, with... It's a difficult principle. Yes, use technology. Why are you using ANAS principle? You see what I just told you. Mm. Register every property. It's, it, within a year, you register every property. And then let people show you how they've made their income. Mm. And if they show you how they've made their income, and they, you realize that's how you collect a lot of money and, 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 and stop a lot of leakages in the system. Do, do, you, do you get my point? Right. You must, we, if we can't plug the leakages and we can't stop, stop people from um, lavishing things and things that they can be, why don't they happen like that over there, everywhere else in the world? I was trying to do a business with somebody in Holland, and I said, oh, the money is going to come through you. When it comes through you, then you said, do you know what the gentleman said? Oh, <laughs> yes, I can receive the money, but when, when the payments come and I have to send it to your company, I would have to take almost 30% was the interest. Without that one, it means he can't do that business. Do, you, you get my point? Right. I think that we should start from a point. Don't arrest people and jail them immediately. Give them the leeway, but make sure that everything is registered properly. And if it's registered properly, show us how, just show us with the papers. I mean, I was in the US, they came to us, they said they want to look at our papers up to, we had our own business five years down the line. The ones we couldn't produce, we couldn't show them how we made it. They, we, they gave us a bill for $40,000 to pay. We were shocked, I couldn't pay at that time. You understand? Because we couldn't show uh, how. And that is a system that is working. That's a system. And maybe as we're talking about property taxes and all of that, that would also feed into the conversation. But yes. just to wrap this, this uh, wrap they don't, up this they, If they want corruption to stop, the corruption will stop. Use the people. If they want, if the government wants corruption to stop, it will stop. Absolutely. So it doesn't necessarily have the will. They have not got at all. Oh. Not, not at all. It's just it's rhetoric. In the day the government, any government in power like CDP, that comes in and says that we are going to stop corruption, we will stop corruption because of today's technology. Look at what they are doing with Ghana Card. 
it, 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 and, and all the things that Esla was talking about. I mean, at the end of the Honorable Esla, for that matter, our own mother, at the end of the day, you, you can see that either she doesn't know what she's talking about, they have no clue what data is, they have, you, you, want, me, you want me to go back to put, give my fingerprints to the telcos, and you tell us that it's not going to telcos, it's going to government. If it's going to the government server or data, then why are you taking something that you've already taken before already? Mm. You've already taken, NIA has taken my fingerprint. Now you are asking me to go register my chip, which part of what is for me so ridiculous, it's not even funny. You want me to go and register my chip. Now you ask me to take again my, my facial, give the, the company my, my, my um, Ghana card, and then give them my finger, fingerprint. Then you say it's, it's not going to a private sector. Yet, with the five cities that we are paying, you say that five cities is going to a private sector. So the private sector, who is it the private sector that owns the app? Because I'm sitting in my home doing it. Because for the 17 million people who are yet to register, that would sum up to about 85 million Ghana cities. Where no, is no, that, where no, is that going? Not, that's, I'm not even worried about the manual. You people are not seeing the, the point. I'm worrying about the, the data because Today, the rich people are not the people who own the gold, it's the people who own the dumb. It's never in the history of humanity, of mankind, civilization, has so much wealth been made by, by, by information and data and mining and all this AI and things. And you're talking about that, you don't own a platform. And the, 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 before I finish, I told you one of the things we do as a party. Apart from the agric negotiating, we would focus on IT. We'll focus and make sure the youth of this country is using IT. We'll make sure that the youth of, the, the youth of this country has access to a uh, platform. We don't have a platform. We don't have any platform. So all this AI that they're talking about is going to, to not. Okay, so, so let's, let's quickly um, do this. Let's quickly do this. Let's try to um, end the conversation with oh. talk about the National Cathedral and um, also the issue to do with former gender minister Sarah Ajwa uh, Safo. Let's quickly wrap the conversation with those two bits. So I would ask you, how do you feel about this national cathedral? Uh, we're, we're looking to spend some $547 million on it. Uh, and it, it could go further. We've committed $25 million as seed money and also wrap with your quick thoughts on Sarah Dwasafu and the entire situation concerning her. Some feel it is targeting. Quick thoughts. Very quick. Um, for the National Cathedral, I, 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 I want to think that, yes, our father got the vision or had the promise there. But for me, it's, I don't see the significance of it at all. So you're talking to the wrong person. I don't think it's necessary. But that is her, his personal commitment. But that we should put emphasis, I don't even think we should worry about, we should not have taken the land, we should not have uh, focused on putting government or Ghana's money into building a cathedral for God. I don't believe in that at all. God is within here. Let's help the people. If we help the people, all this uh, strategy for them that we are trying to fight for their own space that they've earned in history, is because of the contribution that they've made to the, to the ordinary people, the suffering that they did. They didn't build a cathedral for God. You don't need to build a cathedral because God is not there's no God anywhere living, sitting somewhere. God is within man. God is you and I. And it's the things that we do that makes us see God. Okay. So I see, so I don't believe in National Cathedral. I think that this whole thing is a, is, <laughs> it's a waste of our time. Right. Yes. And the old Sarah Adwasafu? Oh, as for Adwasafu, wherever she's a woman like me, and I admire her for being there for her daughter. But this thing that she talks about, I mean, the this thing should have been done a year ago. Right. She shouldn't have left for, the ministry should not have been there for even a month when we realized that she wasn't coming. This is a very important ministry. She should have been dismissed after just about a month? Yes, and when they realized that she wasn't going to come down. Right. You understand? So right. I think that the dismissal is in place. Um, she should not be brought back. Okay. Because there are more millions of young people who need support like a child needs, who can't go to abroad, who are in Ghana, that needs social welfare intervention. So I don't think, and that women who need social development, her ministry is so important and so uh, 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 crucial that for us to even imagine that it was left there for this while, I don't know. It wasn't the best decision.
Right. Well, this is why we'll have to uh, hang the flag of this conversation. But we're grateful that you took the time to interact with us uh, this morning. And we wish you the best in your exploits. Uh, we've been speaking to chairperson of the Convention People's Party, Akusia Frimpoma Sapo, who has been sharing her thoughts on the, the alleged or supposed denigration of the Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and matters of national uh, concern. Well, do stay with us because today we kickstart day two, or day one, I should say, of our second uh, clinic of the Echo Bank Joy News Habitat Fair. It's going to run all the way from today till Sunday. There's a whole lot we'll be coming to you with uh, from the West Hills Mall after the break. Do stay. Welcome back. Where you live does matter. It's finally here, the second clinic of the Echo Bank Joy News Habitat Fair. It takes place at the West Hills Mall from today. Ahead of that, we're asking, given an amount of 800,000 Ghana cities in cash, would you build or buy a standard three-bedroom house close to town or an executive five-bedroom house far from the city center? Well, join us with your thoughts on phone and via social uh, media. But for now, Bernice Abu Beidou Lansa joins us from the West Hills Mall with updates. Uh, Bernice, thank you for connecting. What can you share with us as far as uh, the scene, the environment, and everything that is happening at the West Hills Mall? Right, Benjamin, I'm, I'm excited to be coming to you today from the West Hills Mall located at Wager here in Accra, and it's it's cool let me just say if you're worried about the sun the weather wherever you're watching us from it's very cool here and you would love the environment we are putting together a very exciting clinic for you today let me just walk you through what we have today we've got all our sponsors setting up we have appliances on display we have products on display Ecobank is, is here you know Ecobank are our partners they are offering financial assistance mortgages everything you need to to get when it comes to financing your home so this is the main entrance as you can hear we have uh, our exhibitors, some of them installing their um, trusses, their PVC windows, and everything that you would need to see when you come here. Like I said, we're still setting up. Ecobank is right on my left. Ecobank are our partners uh, with the Habitat Fair. And then we have Elegant Homes and General Construction who are installing some of the windows they have there for you to see. We have Duraplast. Duraplast have a lot of plastic products on display for you. They have the M box, which can serve as trunks for your children who are in high school. It can serve as a storage box for you if you're into production. Anything you need secure storage for, M box can do that. They have the septic tank, they have the Dura block, they have the HDPE pipes, and they have the Dura boat plastic canoe. Isn't it interesting? And then Ecobank has also set up its express point. And as usual, Join News will be here. At a point, we'll be transmitting um, a lot of things right here for you, like we're doing this morning. Joy FM will also be here. So it will be a mix of enjoyment while you make inquiries into what you need for your home acquisition. We've also got the planned city extension projects from cities and habitats also setting up beautifully here. And they have beautiful packages for you when it comes to renting to own your home. And that's, that's something uh, you don't see a lot of companies offering, but the planned city extension project is offering you that. We also have virtual security and it's interesting, yeah? So there's a board here where they're displaying everything they have from CCTV cameras to 
uh, finger accesses and you know different types of CCTVs and virtual security does free consultation for you. So they would visit your site free of charge. They would come in to assess what you need because you know sometimes you may think that you need a CCTV whereas you may need something else like uh, the alarm system. And so let me try and see if there's somebody I can speak to from Virtual Security Africa. Well, I just heard them say Cynthia. How are you doing, Cynthia? AC rather. Okay, forgive me. How are you doing, AC? Doing well. How about you? Doing great. It's good to see you. So tell us, just run us through what you have here, if you can, and let us know what else you have on offer for patrons. Okay, all right. So this is Virtual Security Africa. We are into complete security solutions like the CCTV, intruder alarm systems, fire alarm, access control systems, um, electric fence, any other complete security solutions you can think about. And today we have loads of packages for patrons. So we would advise um, everyone to come to the West Hills Mall to come and have a look at some of our displayed products and also the discounts and packages we have for them. So I, I, I mean, I, about two weeks ago, I interviewed your vice president who said that you're offering free on-site assessment and consultation. It still holds for this clinic, right? It still holds, it still holds. So. Just come, come to the West Coast Mall. We'll give you free consultation on what you need, what best suits your need, the products you need, everything. We'll, we'll just give you a very nice and welcoming um, environment and then orient you on the products you need for your space. As well. So what do I do? Do I come with maybe a picture of my home, a video of my home, just in case um, maybe I live so far away you can't come on site today. Will that help you in assessing the kind of security that I need? Okay, you don't have to give us a picture of your home. We just need maybe um, the number of rooms in your house or the plot size of your home, you, you know. Can you hear me? The plot size of your home and then maybe the number of rooms in your home. You don't have to bring your picture or something. You just have to tell us how your house looks like or your space looks like. Then we'll give you something that best suits you. Yes, please. So I've seen different types of CCTV cameras over there. Can you just help me understand what goes into determining which particular one to use? Okay, so with our cameras, we have the dome cameras and the bullet cameras. Um, the dome cameras best suits indoors and then the bullets for outdoor. They all serve the same purpose, just that one goes indoor and one comes outdoor. And you, you, you can also view remotely with our cameras and also play back in case you're not around and you come back home, you can play back to see what happened behind your back. Yes, please. That's what our cameras serve. I think there's one interesting product in my discussions with you, um, that is the alarm intruder system. I know about the electric fencing, I know about the normal um, the, the wire, wire fencing, but the intruder alarm, alarm system, how exactly does it work? Okay, with the intruder alarm, it detects and deter unauthorized entries into your space. So we have the sensors that is going to, you know, um, capture whoever that is not authorized to come to your space. Yes, so that's what the intruder alarm does. It sets up an alarm. It sets, yes, it does that, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? So that's Virtual Security Africa. You can pass by the West Hills Mall. They don't need a video of your home. They just need to know how many rooms you have, where you live, and they can offer all the advice that you need to keep your home secure. So you know it's not just about acquiring a home, it's also about staying safe, being comfortable and cozy. So um, DBS Industries will be coming. We've got Homeland, Toysland, also will be coming. Enterplus Limited, Blue Rose Limited, and Superlock Technologies have on display some of their products. They say they are the best in Africa when it comes to doors and they've started something new which is the kitchen furnishing. So um, let me just find out what we've got here. I've seen beautiful doors. I have been told that these doors are extremely heavy and I want to test it today. So 
I would be speaking to the sales manager. Okay, you're right. These are really heavy. Yes. I've been engaging you in the studio and you always talk about how heavy they are. Let me... Uh, okay. These are, these are even the frames, but okay. The, these are even the frames, but this is the door. You see two men. Please bring it. Okay. You see two of my men carrying it. It's I mean very, one very... Door. One door. This is our almost 90 kilo uh, door weight. Okay. Our 90 kilogram, exactly very heavy so you can also try yeah yeah see. yeah I, I like to experience so let me just let me just have a feel of it myself yes. oh wow <laughs> that's really heavy i cannot even li yeah, <laughs> lift it yeah. from one side okay so these are from superlock technologies and tell me tell me the importance of the weight when it comes to security doors why is the weight of the door important okay so you know the the weight is also part of the the security nature or the, the security feature because if it is not too heavy, then it's very easy to break through or somebody with a heavy weight can easily break it. But if you are coming to break it, your weight is not up to the, the weight of the door. How can you break it? So yes, the weight is a, a very good security feature also for the doors. Yeah, and trust me, look, these are really nice designs, okay? So this also cannot be easily broken through, right? Of course, uh, mm. this is a glass. Okay. The glass can be broken. When you break the glass, when you break the glass, you still have a burglar proof here to deal with. Okay. So you can break the glass, but you cannot break through the burglar proof. Yes. Mm. So even when somebody tries to break the glass, fine, you break the glass, but you cannot go through because of these bars. Okay. So it's still a uh, good a security. Secure, yes. And it makes it more design. Yeah. Also. Yeah, because uh, it looks nice. It doesn't look so plain and hard and robust. So you're still setting up, but just run us through the kitchen setup that you've introduced as part of your products. Okay, so thank you. So as I said, I mean we are into super kitchens. Okay. Um, okay, so as we're going, <coughs> so the super kitchens, um, we, we just introduced a few years ago. We have the best um, kitchen setup you can have in your homes. I mean, just like you can see this uh, designs here. Yes. Uh, one thing about our kitchen is that, first of all, it's a custom made. So we come to your house, we take measurements, then you sit with a designer to design a very nice, beautiful kitchen for yourself. Uh, what I can also talk about is the material. We are using um, a plywood, a very thick plywood, unlike what other companies are doing. They are using a um, chipboard and that, that can be affected by water. But our plywood is a water resistant, very quality. The top of the kitchen, that's quartz, the high quality grade you can find in the market. So look, I, I, I invite all viewers, all customers, everybody to come and see what Superlock have. <laughs> and if you're watching us outside of Accra, don't worry, because Superlock is one of our experts who have warehouses, offices across the country. So you can just visit any, I'll just let Emmanuel run us through, Ebenezer, sorry, Ebenezer Emmanuel, yeah, I understand. So I'll just let Ebenezer run us through what where they are located and how you can contact them okay so thank you very much Benis, once again all right so superlock we have six branches in ghana we have four branches in accra a branch in Weja, a branch in tema a branch in adenta and accra branch also we have branches in kumasi we take care of kumasi to the up north and we have a branch in takradi also so um superlock we're everywhere in ghana sincerely we sell across Ghana, everywhere. And um, if you want to contact us, we are on the toll-free number, star 9999, and you can reach us, star 9999, and you can reach us everywhere in Ghana. Right. Before I let you go, um, just I'm just seeing something really yes. elegant here, yes. really elegant designs. Yes. And, I, and I must say this, it's not because Joy News is the one organizing this. The finishing is really beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. Just run us through these products and what they are. Okay, so I have um, burglar proofs here. Um, the burglar proof is what is there, burglar proof for safety and uh, security. Then I also have balustrade also here. I have many kinds of balustrade. I have stainless steel balustrade, which we sell the highest grade of stainless steel. That's 316 which grade, which is this. Okay. The top okay. of this is it's stainless steel, steel. Okay. yes. And the down is a glass, the thickest glass, 16.76 um, laminated glass balustrade you can also find. We also have aluminum balustrade. We have cast aluminum. So this is aluminum balustrade, um, pure aluminum. It will not rust, it will not corrode, even by the sea. You don't have any problem. 
Then I have also aluminum, uh, we have um, anodized aluminum. It looks like stainless steel, this one. Okay. Uh, but it's not stainless steel material, it's aluminum material. So if you look yeah, at it, it you see. Quite shiny, exactly. Shiny Benis, you are too smart. Why? <laughs> Thank you. Are you into construction? I, yeah. Maybe I should consider it. <laughs> good, good, good. So, yes, like I mentioned. Then also we have aluminum windows and doors. As you can see here, these are my simple um, um, sliding windows for aluminum windows and doors. I have the wood finishing. This is pure aluminum, but the finishing looks woody. Okay. And this one is also pure aluminum, but black finishing. I have all these products in stock. I mean, what I'm continuing to say is that let them come. They should come to the stands to see. Even after the stands, you can find me in the showrooms. Right. Also. So this is what Superlock Technology has on display for you. Beautiful balustrades, burglar proofs, PVC windows. They have heavy security doors. They say it's the best you can ever find. Israeli technology. And they have the super kitchen for you. So please, just pay us a visit. We are at the West Hill Small Wager. And when you come here, it's a one-stop shop for everything housing, okay? So when you leave Superlock Technologies, you can go to Blue Rose Limited. Let me, let me just get a word or two from Blue Rose Limited. Um, hello. Hi. Hi. I'm Bernice. Charles. Nice to meet you, Charles. So I see that you have this on display. What does Blue Rose City have to offer? We, are, we offer real estate properties ranging from one bedroom expandable to four bedroom houses. And we have terrace, we have semi-detached, and we have detached houses with different, different and affordable pricing units. So what we have here is the semi-detached. Yeah, with the semi-detached, we are having different, different types. We have the standard and we also have the executive. With the executive, you have the fence wall, you have the end suits, you have uh, the compound, you also have the kitchen, very, very nice house as well. So, so are these houses already made? Where are they located? And how can um, a patron access them? So we are located at Kaswa Bodumbram, just behind the Golden Gate Hotel. So you can also uh, locate us at Accra too. But you can also go to our website, www.bluerosslimited.com, to have all our details as well. You can also call us or WhatsApp us on 020-1322-101. Do you make custom-made homes? Yes. If I come with my own design and I say, I like what, where you're located, you have the land, but I want my house built this way. No, please. Yes, please. <laughs> but is it est are they located in one estate, these houses that you're offering? Yes, please. They are located in one estate. Yeah. So far, we are having about 2,000 plus houses. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. That's a lot. It's a very huge community. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Charles. I'll leave the rest for you to uh, come and find out. Yeah. And um, yeah, so basically, it's still set up ongoing. Uh, let me speak to plant cities who have the rent to own policy, one that you don't find a lot of companies running. Hello, good morning. Anybody to speak to me from the Plan City Extension Project? Hi, I'm Bernice. I'm Elizabeth. Elizabeth, nice to meet you. So tell us what you have to offer. Okay, so we sell lands and buildings. Uh -huh. So um, you can pay based on monthly basis. Yeah, so we give you the opportunity to make your monthly payments, then we make preparations towards your building, then eventually the buildings become yours. So these are not ready-made homes, but they are located in one particular area, and I pay towards owning the home. Yes, please. What if I want to pay outright? Yes, you have 20% discount. Oh, wow. Yes, please. <laughs> so please come come and speak to Elizabeth here. Uh, her colleagues are also here from Cities and Habitats with their rent to own policy and they will help you answer all your questions. They will help you make the most important decision. The final stand I will go to is Elegant Homes and Elegant Homes are also displaying the kind of windows that they have on offer, the doors and you know we've been speaking to the 
the chief executive of the company and she's been telling us what they have on offer for about two weeks we've been speaking to her so we will speak to a rep from elegant homes hello what's your name Laurentia. Laurentia. someone is watching us today i'm sure for the very first time and is wondering elegant homes what do you do what can i get from you so we have homes executive homes three four bedroom houses on sale we urge everybody to come around to come and have a look at the difference and the designs that we have so that you'll be able to choose from them, any of them. You know, people like to hear a lot about discounts and payment plans, elegant homes. What can you say about your payment plans and your discount packages? Okay, so for this fair, we are giving a 10% discount on all our houses. We also given fitted kitchen and also fitted wardrobe. We have the ceiling speakers as well, fiber optic, uh, fiber optic uh, internet connection as well, and many more. So we want everybody to come so that we can discuss more. I believe we've been able to tease you a bit on what to expect here at the West Hills Mall located in Wager. It's the second clinic of the Joy News Ecobank Habitat Fair, and you've heard some of our exhibitors. Our main sponsor, Ecobank, is located here. They are ready to give you financial options. They are, they are, they are ready to give you mortgages. Just come, come and sit with them. The good thing about the Habitat Fair is that all our exhibitors are ready to engage you, to give you tailor-made products and services. You've all heard them talk about how they can work with your plan, with your payment plan, offer custom homes, custom doors so please just make sure you come in if you're not able to come today we are here till Sunday tomorrow the whole day from 8 a.m. through to the night we are here same thing on Sunday after church you can pass by so don't worry if you can't make it today that's why we have two extra days. We've also got Sukasa properties St. Gobe in Ghana so you know it's just a one-stop shop for all your house needs. So Benjamin, I am just going to take my time and relax here and make some personal inquiries. Hopefully I'll see you here around today. But for now, that's it from me here from the West Hills Mall. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bernice, for bringing us all the scoop. And I, I love seeing you try to lift uh, those doors. Good luck with that. But that was my colleague, Bernice Abu Lanta, all the way from the West Hills Mall. Don't you forget, it's not just today. Even if you're not able to pass through today, being a Friday, you still have Saturday and uh, Sunday. Make it a point to pass by because guess what? Where you live matters. Now, we ask you this question. Given an amount of 800K, 800,000 Ghana cities, would you build or buy a standard three-bedroom house close to town or an executive five-bedroom house far from the city center? Choices. We asked you to join us with your thoughts on phone and via social media, and some of you have done exactly that. Let's take a look right before we activate the phone lines uh, for some of your thoughts. So this first one from Mr. Mensa says, given if that amount can buy a house, then I am for buying. Oh, that's what he's saying. He would rather go for a buy than a build option. Uh, the next question, not one that we can answer, but Israel Date says, far from the city center. So you would go for the luxurious five uh, bedroom uh, house, far from the city center, rather than a two or three bedroom in the city uh, center. Those are some thoughts you've been sharing. But let's activate the phone lines now. You can see the number rolling at the bottom of your screen, 0302-211-691, extension 2. 0302-211-691, extension uh, 2. Do call us and share your thoughts with us. Of course, Apart from that, you can also share your thoughts on some of the discussions we've been having uh, this morning with the National Chairperson of the CPP, among others.
But the Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair is in partnership with Ecobank, the Pan-African Bank, and powered by the Plan City Extension Project from Cities and Habitats, rent to own and sponsored by Elegant Homes and General Construction Limited, where quality meets value, Virtual Security Africa, Complete Security Solutions, Superlock Technologies Limited, you deserve the best. DBS Industries Limited, we truly are your roof experts. Duraplast Limited, where Duraplast goes, water flows. And finally, Gold Key Properties, building prestige since 1997. Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair, remember, where you live matters. And do share your thoughts with us, like I've intimated, 0302-211-691, extension 2. We have all the time for you. Call in and share your thoughts uh, with us. But before that, hold it. That's hello. How about treating your family to a summer holiday in South Africa? Come journey to South Africa for a good time in our beautiful country. Get to know the locals and our languages. And if you're looking to let your hair down and relax, or you're just in the mood for some fun, family-friendly adventures, South Africa has got everything you need. This summer was Zanila. Come this side and experience a holiday worth talking about. That is for our journey to South Africa. Hopefully, you'll be accompanying Winston there. But happy uh, moment is here again. Let's storm World Cup Qatar 2022 with Storm Energy Drink, Puma Soft Drinks, and Awake Drinking Water from Casa Preco Company Limited. Simply buy your favorite Storm Energy Drink, Puma Soft Drinks, and Awake Drinking Water. And all you have to do is text the four digits unique number on the neck of the bottle to short code STAR780 HASH. You choose option two and follow the prompts on all networks for free. You could be one of the lucky winners to win uh, to this year's World Cup in the monthly draw. You could also win TVs, fridges, microwave ovens, mobile phones, home theaters, free drinks, and more instantly. Don't waste time. Grab a bottle of Storm Energy Drink, Puma Soft Drinks, and Awake Drinking Water, and let's storm Qatar this World Cup. This promotion is on the NLA Caritas platform, and this advert is FDA approved. Terms and conditions do apply. All righty, so you stay with us. Uh, let me bring in Kingsley, who joins the conversation. Kingsley, a very good morning to you. It appears we've lost Kingsley. If you can, uh, please call in uh, again. All right, uh, do we have Benjamin on the line? Hi, good morning. How are you? I am well, Benjamin. I hear you're calling from Tema. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I just want to contribute a bit on this issue of Dr. Kwame Kuma and also on our reserves and right. the percentages that we get from as royalty. Mm. Number one. Right. I think it is absurd and nonsensical for any anyone, any sensible Benin to try and denigrate the memory and history of Dr. Kwame Kuma. Right. When you go to a place like South Africa, as you rightly mentioned, the memory and history of Dr. Kwame, uh, sorry, the memory of history of Madiba is revered and honest. Now, we should understand that in any incident of uh, trying to bring independence or liberty or liberation, no one person does it. But there's always the one who is the forefront, who does the forerunner and the support on the other. So in trying to honor the memory, we all know the history tells us great that the vision and the achievement of the of, of Dr. Kwame Kuma has never been measured by anyone. There's no political party in this nation who has measured to a quarter of what Dr. Kwame Kuma did with his vision. It's all around us. So who in his right sense will try to denigrate the achievement of Dr. Kwame Kuma? Not just for Ghana, but for the whole of Africa. Look at what Dr. Kwame Kuma tried to achieve with Africa. Read the 1965 speech of Dr. Kwame Kuma in Ethiopia, and it will tell you that if Africa had followed the vision of Dr. Kwame Kuma, 
Africa will not be where it is today. Africa will be well advanced right. than we are now. So any Guinean or any individual who would attempt to denigrate the achievements and the history and the honor of Dr. Kwame Kuma should and must be kicked out with impunity. Also, I would want to say that our leaders, apart from Dr. Kwame Kuma, have, have, have not, they've not served us right in any way. Because when you look at the wealth of Ghanaians, I always say that Ghana, as a, as a nation, is very wealthy, but Ghanaians are poor. Travel outside the country of Ghana, and you'll see how Ghanaians are struggling to make ends meet. Meanwhile, we've got everything and anything we need to make Ghana a first world nation. But our leaders are so selfish that they think about their stomach and not the forward march of the nation. How could anyone with, with vision for the nation in its right sense negotiate for 4% of what belongs to you? Is the gold going to rot if no one mines it? Is the oil, is the oil going to rot if no man mines it? Mm. If no one wants to give us a better deal, let the gold stay in the ground. We're not feeding the gold. We're not going to feed the oil. We're not going to feed the bauxite. Right. So if no one is ready to give us a better deal, then the bauxite, the oil, the gold, the diamond should remain in the ground. Thank you. Until we can have the machinery and the people to mine it for Ghana to have a better deal. All right, Ben from Tema, uh, passionate uh, you know, delivery there. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Let's bring in Victor from Prestia. Hello, Victor. Hello, Victor. Good morning. Yeah. Can you hear me? What's your name, please? My name is Banana Zinenuma Victor. All right. Victor, please go ahead with uh, what you'd like to share with us this morning. Mm, uh, but I'm uh, you, you miss Israel Ae? Yeah. Oh, well, we'll be sure to let him know of that. Okay. But I was uh, the half time said I wanted to talk about. All right, please go ahead. What is the negotiation between like the skittish personnel? Mm -hmm. They should also do something about skittish personnel. So they should want the skittish personnel to see how to also improve their life. Okay. You know, sometimes when we are going to pension, we could not even afford our pension money to build. Mm. We should start to come down to the lower rank so that we can also know how to negotiate to build, to have a, a home. Sure, sure. Point made. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Victor, for calling uh, to share your thoughts. You can also call through and share your thoughts just as he did. Uh, 0302 211 691 extension 2. Let us know what your thoughts are on uh, these options. We'll take a short break. Uh, we'll be right back. We see a lot of you on the line. We'll be right back after this break. Thank you for staying with us. Some of you are sharing your thoughts with us, uh, but we have something exciting that we're bringing you as we wrap the show. The imperative for reparations to Africans and people of African descent for historical crimes has gained prominence in recent years uh, more than any other time in history, probably. Now, there is an increased need to unpack how slavery, colonialism, and racism intersect and impact the lives of black people across the world. It is against this backdrop that the Global Summit on Reparations and Racial Healing was organized in Accra, that is from the 1st of August to the 4th of August, ending yesterday. Well, we're joined in the studio by Dr. Amara Enya, President, uh, Global uh, Black, and there's also Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, Founder 1619 Project. Ladies, thank you very much for joining the conversation. Glad to be here. 
So it's interesting because it's just recently on the back of this very event that we heard our president talk about reparation for black people, the colonized, uh, you know, across the world. But tell us a bit about what do you do, basically. I'll start with you, Nicole. What do we do about reparations or why did we have the summit? Why, do you, why are you having the summit? Basically, what have you done in the past? Why the summit in the first place? Well, we decided to have the summit because uh, there are a group of us who have been working on the issue of reparations across the diaspora as well as for the continent. And we feel that uh, we are in somewhat of an unprecedented moment where reparations as a societal issue is being taken more seriously and being treated as a legitimate issue. Uh, I think uh, the most that we've seen in our lifetimes. Uh, so this was an opportunity to bring us all together to strategize on how we move the issue of reparations forward. And of course, we came to Accra because Accra is the birthplace of Pan-Africanism. It is a place where uh, we saw this understanding of all of us as global African citizens who are all facing anti-blackness and, and working to move forward. Amara, what more can you say about this entire event and, and what culminated in what we're seeing now, this three-day event that we've seen? Yeah, so it was important for us to, one, make sure that the entire global um, black world was represented. So we have people coming from Europe, from Central and South America, from the U.S., um, who are experts and work in the space of reparations. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a declaration that came, that came out of uh, this event. It builds okay. on the Abuja Accords from 1993 and the Durban Declaration and Program of Action from 2001. And it asserts, one, the importance of prioritizing reparations, not just as a process of remembering, but as the path forward to the kind of self-determining agency that we want for Africa and for people of African descent around the world. Mm -hmm. We have a collective strategy that is now in development that engages not just the grassroots, but also we have the African Union Commission has been involved on this question of how to develop a common position for Africa on the issue of reparations and healing. So a lot of this was about building relationships between inside the continent, but also between Africa and the diaspora, mm -hmm. so that we can know each other, understand each other, develop collective strategy to challenge and change the systems and structures that from the transatlantic slave trade through colonialism, neocolonialism, continue to <clears throat> exploit and harm. Now you can look at, especially since we're here in West Africa, the, the entire West African subregion, and then the picture of colonialism is so glaring. What was done recently, I was you know, taking a look at some photos, a number of these countries have those points of no return across West Africa, Ghana, Sierra Leone, you know, Nigeria, other places as well. But when you look at this, this trend, why would you say reparation is so important that we have to have reparation as you are calling for? It's important because it is about repairing the harm. It is, this is not something that is just in the past. We are experiencing ongoing legacies of continued exploitation that are represented when we look at international institutions, financial institutions, monetary policy, health policy. When you assess the disparities that people of African descent face around the world, whether in South America, on the continent, in the West, it is clear that there is ongoing harm that is being perpetrated. So reparations is about accountability. So the perpetrators of the harm, it is about repair so that we can actually live with our human rights and our human dignity. It is the path forward to the kind of Africa and Africans, whether in Africa or abroad, that we want and deserve. Mm. Nicole, for you, what would you say are the highlights of, of this summit that you just had? What, what stood out for you coming into Ghana for this you know, summit? Well, um, there were many highlights. I would say certainly um, when the president of Ghana spoke out forcefully for reparations. Mm. That was a very powerful and necessary moment. Uh, we know that this has not been the norm of um, heads of state on the continent joining with us, us in the diaspora and calling for reparations. So mm. to us, um, we hope that that will then help do uh, what Dr. Enya said, is move forward that collective movement towards repair. Um, and then just to, to be here, um, uh, for many of us in our ancestral home, for I, I brought two students with me who have never been to the continent, and to see them being able to connect um, with people from feel? across the diaspora. I just was uh, having breakfast with one of them this morning, and he is transformed. He, wow. He couldn't even articulate what it meant for us to be here, uh, to be here together and collectively working for the betterment of our people. So um, it's it's 
I think I'm going to need a few days to process everything that we've experienced. But you know, sometimes we, we of course focus on the struggles of, of black people, but to come here and feel an empowerment, to feel the strength of our ancestors, to feel that we are, we are working to vindicate them for all that they went through, but also working uh, to create a better future for our future descendants um, felt extremely empowering and it's something that I will never forget. How did you feel when our president, Nanako Fuada, spoke about the fact that, yes, it is important that we have reparation for, for all the centuries of colonialism? And how did you feel? Because it wasn't just him. There were other prominent leaders, like you mentioned, from the African Union. What sort of, is this a shot in the arm for the reparation project? Yes, I'll answer, then I'll let Dr. Enya answer. But I certainly sure. think so, uh, because we know that um, not having leaders on the continent joining in supporting this has been used as a wedge by right. the colonial powers. To make it difficult, right? this to, was. Right, to delegitimize our, um, our struggle for reparations by saying, well, even people on the continent don't think that this is something that we should be doing. Mm. So it removes that wedge that the colonial powers have used um, in order to deny what, in fact, they do owe uh, to those of us in the diaspora and on the continent continent. Right. Amara? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we know that not only is this a, a project that engages the masses, the grassroots, the people, but we had to have leadership also stepping in to say this is a priority. Right. So to have a sitting president, a head of state, unequivocally stating that reparations is an imperative will send a strong message not just to the people, but also to other heads of state to say, yes, we should come together and develop a common position because this issue is not going away anytime soon. And as leaders, we have a responsibility to carry this forward. So it was a huge moment for us. We've had the Abuja Declaration. Now we've had the Accra Declaration. What next? The next step is putting this into action. So we are building on the work that has happened from our ancestors, people that have come before us. But we knew we wanted to be intentional about coming together, bringing people together to develop a collective strategy. We are moving that strategy as it relates to government. We're moving that strategy as it relates to even religious institutions. We had a meeting at the Vatican a few weeks ago where we're oh, talking about their role, absolutely, in initiating the transatlantic slave trade. We're moving this agenda now at the grassroots with all of the organizations that are part of this effort to say wherever you are in the US, in South America, in Europe, in Asia, they are now operating this declaration becomes an organizing mechanism to now develop that collective strategy to move forward. So we're really excited about the, the, the large amount of work ahead, but we're really um, excited about it. I'll tell you what, I'm excited too. <laughs> but uh, moving forward, just a quick question. So in terms of reparation, what exactly are we looking at? Well, I don't think that you can just give a kind of catch-all answer to Because honestly, that. I was saying yes. this morning that while it's a good call, reparation cannot possibly be enough to to account for what was done. There's no paying for that. But so in the concept of reparation, what are we looking at? Right. So one, there, there can never be um, a paying of that debt, right, right that accrued over uh, more than 500 years. And I would argue is still accruing. And I also don't think you can say that there is one way that reparations will be achieved across the diaspora. We are in different circumstances. Um, right. And different communities, I think, have to establish for themselves what does repair look like. Mm. Uh, personally, for me, repair has multi prongs. Um, you have to, one, stop the harm that is currently occurring. You have to have financial reparations. All of these systems, slavery and uh, colonialism and apartheid, were systems of economic exploitation. Right. And black people are in forced poverty. We are not in poverty because we don't want to work hard. We're in poverty because entire systems were set up to extract wealth from us and deliver that wealth to the colonial powers. So I think we have to stop the current harms. We have to do financial repair. And then there has to be an, a period of atonement and acknowledgement. Uh, my work, the 1619 Project, exists because we have not wanted uh, white people, whether they are in America, whether they are in South America, whether they are uh, in Europe, have not wanted to acknowledge what has been done and the way that that legacy continues to shape our modern society. Right. Um, so that's my idea. I know Dr. Enya has others, but I really think um, the hardest work we have to do is creating the political landscape that allows reparations to move forward. Right. Now, how would it be achieved? What would it look like? That's frankly the easiest part of this struggle. The hardest part is actually convincing uh, enough people in power that this is what must be done. And as right. Frederick Douglass said, right. you know, power concedes nothing without a demand. And so we are here trying to make that demand. It's interesting you quote uh, Frederick Douglass there. But just to wrap the conversation, as I take your final thoughts, 
Uh, we've spoken, you talk about the system and, for example, negative terms of trade. That, that is a huge part of the system because there is the neo-colonialist angle to the conversation as well. But as we wrap the conversation, what would be your parting words? And can we expect another summit sometime <laughs> soon? Well, there will definitely be additional gatherings. We've already started some of those initial conversations, right. um, really to delve deeper into some of the things that we were able to touch on. Um, in this gathering, but it is, you know, it is the information sharing. We want people to learn, have a more deep understanding of what we mean when we say reparations. Right. It is not just the compensation component, it is the transformation of these existing systems to ensure that there is no repetition of the harm. That's one of the pillars mm -hmm. of reparations, a guarantee of non-repetition. So we have to change the systems and structures, and that implies government, leadership, NGO, civil society, right. all engaging to together in this work. And so we are, again, we have this strategy that we're moving forward, but it involves additional dialogue, public information, information sharing, and relationship building within the continent, but also between the continent and the diaspora. Okay, 30 seconds and it's a wrap. We have to get up. Um, we just hope that this will be the start of future conversations. Um, that we will see, as Dr. Inya said, we are planning to hold these summits in other places. Mm. Um, and that when we look back, this will, this will be seen as a historic moment where we were able uh, to finally move forward on what uh, generations of our ancestors had been working toward. Definitely historic. Thank you so much, uh, ladies, for joining us Thank in the guys. studio and on the AM show. Thank Dr. You. Amra Enya, President uh, Global Black, and then Nicole Hannah Jones, who is with uh, the project as well. We wrap the conversation at this uh, juncture. Thank you for all of you who have done the watching. Of course, Bernice Abubedu Lanza came to us from the West Hills Mall today. Let's connect again, same time on Monday. Up next, join Newsdesk.